Welcome to the Funker 530 Show. This has been a long time coming, and this is going to be our very first episode. I want to thank everybody for their patience while we moved to the new studio and got everything set up. But most importantly, I want to talk about our guest today. Our guest is going to be Wayne Hallett. Wayne is a current member of Chosen Company, a band of foreign volunteers fighting in Ukraine against Russia. But Wayne is also a former member of the Canadian Infantry, specifically the Princess Patricia's Light Infantry. Wayne spent 18 months in Afghanistan and describes and compares his time in Afghanistan to his most recent time in Ukraine. Now we're going to cover a wide range of topics, everything from, again, why Wayne is in Ukraine to what Chosen Company's role is compared to the International Foreign Legion, for example. We're also going to be covering something that hasn't been public knowledge to date about one of Chosen Company's members. Thank you very much for being here, and I'd like to welcome Wayne Hallett to the Funker 530 Show. Drop! Mussy's hit! Mud down! Okay, this is you're alive, you're alive. You all right? Can I change positions, please? Yep, yep, yep. Wayne, you can change positions now, if you like. I know that might have been a problem when yeah. you got hit by indirect fire, which, you know, folks can watch the, the companion footage for, but thanks for coming out to... Yeah, uh, sometimes it's not exactly all fun and games. <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't mean to laugh, but we just got done the, spending. The point is to maintain your composure, though. You, you know, that's yeah. actually something that we didn't cover a whole lot in the companion footage, right? Because we, we just did the whole breakdown of Operation Shovel, yes. which took place, uh, what, uh, August of 23, yes. if I'm not mistaken. We didn't actually cover the, the composure aspect to that, but I think it's something that is an eventuality we'll end up wanting to talk about because while it was while it became kind of a meme i think there are some underlying important points that come along with that mm. you know um but i we'll, we'll end up getting there foremost i want to say thanks for coming out because this is this is our first time doing this having somebody in house and you guys vol you volunteering to come out here it, it means a lot thanks i mean uh i'm not gonna complain much about a free trip but <laughs> <laughs> well we, we were happy to bring you out here you know, because uh, one of the things that I noted about, you know, Operation Shovel, again, if people are wondering about that, you know, everybody knows of the 15 or the 26 minute video that that kind of went viral that uh, of Chosen Company. We'll talk more about Chosen Company in a second. Um, everybody knows of that. What we did is we, we broke that down from your perspective, from Chosen's perspective. Yes, yes. Um, and I think that that provided a whole lot of value and context. And that was actually the original reason we wanted you to come out was to break that yeah. down. And, and I'm, I'm glad to do it because, uh, uh, since that video came out, like I was active on Reddit, uh, myself and Mossy. So we're, we, we were both injured on, on that up and we've been, I mean, obviously we're both, uh, recovered now or, and, and active and, and, uh, back, back at it. Well, I'll be back at it soon enough, but, uh, we were asked to go in and, engage with people that were commenting on the video because people are really wondering, you know, how, how am I doing? How is he doing? And uh, if, whether if we are still alive. And so then we started engaging with them and that really, that interaction actually did a huge, uh, a huge amount for uh, raising funds, not only for chosen company, but for, for other Ukrainian units through, uh, through a couple NGOs that we, that we help out or that help out us. And uh, it, it was, it was interesting. I mean, uh, you do see a lot of questions that get, that get brought up. And I tried, uh, I tried uh, answering those when we did the the talk over of the video. Kind of I mean, an AMA, ask me anything on the. Uh, oh, you're talking about our the companion footage, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So the uh, it, like the like people asked like, okay, like uh, uh, a big thing with the Z guy. The Russians were like, oh, that guy, that guy was a journalist, because you know obviously Russia is going to try and try and play everything out to be the victim because mm -hmm. you know they invaded another country, so obviously they're the victim. And, but it's like, why is a journalist 50 meters away from a Ukrainian trench that is, you know, actively being engaged on a daily basis until we actually go in and do the assault? You know, like the Russians knew that we were coming to do assault. They moved an RPG right down to the end of the lane of the Miklik. So obviously they're aware it's going to happen when and how they're not 100% sure, but they knew that that position was going to get hit because it was getting hit. You know, the buildup was going. Why would they put a journalist there? But that's the Russian propaganda and, you know, simple-minded people that don't understand what it's really like on the ground. They just be like, oh, yeah, prop that, that's a journalist. It's not a journalist. Like, as we broke down in the, in, the, in the video, like, the Russians set up positions. They get complacent in the trench, lazy in the trench. 
you know, not all these guys are actual professional soldiers. Some of them were, were just taken off off of whatever for, and they've got like a month or so of training. They're sent out there and they're putting in the front lines and then the secondary lines are hardened soldiers, right? They're meat shields, cannon fodder. Well, that guy, he, he, he was out in the front trench. He wasn't a journalist. In his trench system, I guarantee you, was his little cubby hole with his weapons, with his, his rifle, with his ammo, with his grenades. And when he started running, he just left it. He was fleeing. He was running from from the trench that the Ukrainians then entered. Yeah, and I think people but then are going to have pinched to, between. People are going to have see, to watch. People are going to yes. have to watch the 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 breakdown that you did. Yeah, and they'll, and they'll so understand. That. Like he was told to surrender. He was told to stop. He actually yeah. got into the trench. One of our guys did grab his hand, and then he went back. And then eventually, it was just like, okay, once he got a gun, you could see him kind of scrambling around. And then it was like, fuck him. All right, kill him. He doesn't want to surrender. He wants to go get a gun. Fuck around, find out, right? So we're gonna we're gonna end up kind of circling back to some of the operations that you guys have, but, you know, something that would be helpful first and foremost is help us understand who Chosen is. Who is Chosen Company? So Chosen Company is, uh, it, it was originally started from 2nd uh, Battalion in the Foreign Legion, right? It was a collective of guys that got tired of a lot of, just a lot of the, the nonsense that was going on in the Legion because the Legion was taking a lot of people from a lot of different a lot of different areas, a lot of different countries, a lot of different experiences. And then people were just given positions and, you know, abuse of power and stuff like that was going on. And guys were just like, hey, no, wait, we came here to fight. We didn't come here to just be, you know, trench sitters. Like, we want to do something. So then those guys that were like-minded banded together. And then they created Chosen Company. And that originally started in the Legion. And then eventually those guys left the Legion and actually created a company inside the Ukrainian army itself. So... Like Chosen Company isn't part of the Legion, even though we get uh, we get a lot of you know uh, Foreign Legion uh, Chosen Company. We're we're actually part of the Ukrainian Army itself. From a from a difference perspective, it, is it really a reputation based that it, it's important to differentiate, or is it or they're legal or any? I don't I don't think it's anything legal. Like we're not going to sue somebody, but well, no, I mean from maybe a, a law like, of armed conflict perspective, is there is there any? Uh, lawful differentiation from chosen uh, to the legion, or are both Ukrainian military? Well, they're they're different branches of the Ukrainian military, right? Okay. So, like legion, I, I mean, they ge generally get different tasks. With us, we wanted something different. I mean, I wasn't part of Second Battalion. I, I was. I came into uh, Chosen Company when it was his, its own company. Uh, I mean, I, I got there uh, not long after it was formed, but. Uh, so I, I just want to make sure that people don't think I was there right from day zero of it. Uh, but the, the chosen company just they wanted they wanted to create their own thing. They wanted they wanted to have their own identity, and they they wanted to break away from like poor reputations, right? And that's why chosen company. I mean, uh, you can take a look at the recruiting standards that we have on uh, on Reddit uh, that that was put up by our, our our commander, and you can see like we try and keep a high standard. Like we don't want just anybody coming to us. We want people that have that have the, the the tenacity and they have the the capabilities to do what we do, you know. Because if we start if we start watering ourselves down, that lowers our capacity and it also gives us it's going to eventually give us like a bad image, and then Ukrainians uh, Ukrainian commanders won't be wanting us to come do missions with them. When you say do what we do, what how would you describe what you what it is that you do? Uh, uh, we're very aggressive. We're very aggressive. We 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 punch up. You know, I, I think every situation we've gone into, there's always been more Russians than there is us. We understand that, but we train specifically for that. Like we have almost like an undisciplined discipline, you know, like we, we're all from different types. And when we're, when we're just kind of on base doing our own thing, you know, there's, I call it like morale fuckery. I don't know the language, but it's part, fine. Of, part of my French, It's fine, but it's, uh, it, you know, like we have that and it's a bit of chaos, but it's like when it comes to us actually getting to work, like the camaraderie's there, you know, the brotherhood's there. Like we all take care of each other. We all push. It's, it's, it's something like even with me being in the, in the Canadian army, like I spent 14 years in the Canadian army and these are the best men I've ever served with. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't swap teams at all. You know, I've been in Afghanistan and I still, I would still choose this. Like if I could go anywhere in the world with any group of dudes, I would take these guys, you know, like these are, they're just phenomenal. And we have dudes from all kinds of different backgrounds. 
we got guys with that have that have been in the been in the military for a couple months. We have guys like me that have been in you know pretty much majority of my life, and it's 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 awesome, you know. I'm gonna ask you a loaded question. Have at her. Are you fighting for Ukraine, or are you fighting against Russia? So that's that's a question when uh, it's it's an like an evolving question, right? When I first joined uh, joined up with Chosen, I was fighting for Ukraine because I believe what uh, what what was happening to Ukraine was wrong. Fundamentally, it's wrong. Like they they are getting. I mean, I don't know the proper term to it. I just call it cultural side, right? Russia is taking their land and they're they're erasing their culture. They're taking their people. They're reeducating them. They would essentially want to erase the identity of Ukraine and replace it with a like a subclass of of Russians. They don't want to be Russians. They just don't want them to be you know, have their own identity as Ukrainians. They just kind of want to use them, use them, right? And uh, it's, it's, it's not right. You know, like you see, you see how they murder civilians. They constantly, they constantly target civilians. Even now they're still targeting civilians. And they try and sit there and be like, oh no, we're not targeting civilians. It's like, oh cool, man. You're just hitting schools and, you know, random apartment buildings. Like you, you either admit that your technology is terrible or you're intentionally aiming for civilians. Like what, what is it? You know, and, and that, that's just not right. If you're a soldier, go for soldiers. If you're military, go after military targets. And to be it, you know, if you got, if if, if you want to sit there and go for for send your soldiers after civilians, no, like that's that's not on. That's that that's that's morally against what I believe. So, you know, I did what uh, a lot of guys with with that mindset would do and went signed up. I mean, yeah, I could sit there on Facebook and complain, you know, put up the you know thoughts and prayers in my in my background, but realistically that's not going to do anything you go do something about it and then when i did something about it i went there and i joined up uh you go through a lot of hardship you know with the ops that we do with the intensity of the ops that we do like you you through the the hardship you build bond right just like with when you go through training in the military the reason why all your initial training courses are so so just ridiculously intense you know like you're getting yelled at for how you fold your socks it's it's to keep you keep your stress levels up, but then you start building partnerships with other guys, right? And you you unknowingly build these bonds with these other guys, and as those stress levels increase and increase, those bonds get stronger, right? It's it's like a family, you know. You can make fun of me, but if he tries to make fun of me, you're gonna beat his ass, and that's that's eventually what it comes down to is like. I think a lot of us stick around not so much, not so much to help the bigger picture. It's it's because we can't. We can't live with like our family out there. We can't live with other members of Chosen being out there. You know, like we're going back to fight for each other. And it, so it's, it's. So it's almost a neither, to be honest with you at this point, right? Well, it's, it's not really a neither because we have fallen guys that are out there. Like Russia has, has killed some of our guys. And it's like, well, now we got a personal issue with you. So now it's personal. Yeah. Now it's, now it's your fighting against Russia. Yeah. They, 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 they hurt some of us and it's like, well, now we're going to make sure we keep killing a lot more of you than you, than you can hurt us. And there's actually going to be a, a specific situation that is very personal, that isn't public knowledge that we're going to, that yes. we're going to cover eventually. But I think there's some other stuff that we want to kind of get through first in along the same path of, you know, who chosen is and what you do, I would say from an available information perspective, a little bit less is available for Chosen's general location. Where exactly, or as much as you can share, has Chosen's historical stomping grounds been? Uh, we've been uh, generally stomping around Pervomayask. And that's, uh, for people that, that don't know, that's west of Donetsk, and it's south of Advika. Avdivka, whatever. Avdivka, yeah. yeah. So we, like, we haven't been in Avdivka, but when uh, the Russians did their push... They did a pincer movement around Avdivka, so we were we were, excuse me, we were holding off against the the southern uh, pincer, and even to this day, the ground that we were holding is still uh, held by Ukrainians. So we we actually pulled up the the uh, live map and looked at Pervomysk, and there is uh, a market less advance from Russia in Pervomysk today than the surrounding areas specifically to the north in Evdivka. Yeah, and we were we were the unit that actually pushed into Pervomayask initially to, to get a foothold into the town and started taking that ground. So you guys were 
so at one point in time, and you've been you've been here just to kind of wheel everything back for a second. You've mm-hmm. been here now for what a day and a half or so. We've we've been chatting, we're hanging out. We were we were working out, you know, <laughs> earlier today. You're kind kind of a badass for working out with a bunch of shrapnel still in you, which we'll we'll eventually get to. You got shrapnel in what you know, bunch in your butt cheek. Yeah, you got a bunch of shrapnel in your chest cavity still. Uh, is there still shrapnel in your shoulder as well? Yeah, I got well. I got a uh, shrapnel underneath my like in my tricep. I got shrapnel uh, in my side and in my shoulder blade. Uh, my right uh, ass cheek is definitely peppered. And then that got, one you didn't show me. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, yeah, I spared but, you that one. Uh, um, and then I got uh, I got shrapnel in my in my uh, right lower leg below my knee. I got uh, I think there's uh, two pieces have been removed, so I think there's another four left in there. And that was that. That was incurred on one of your last operations, which you know we'll eventually get to. Yeah, yeah. I'm not very good at hot potato. <laughs> yeah, we'll cover we'll cover that when we get there. But let, just, let's go back to Pervo Maisk for a second. Yes. So you're the entirety of the time that you were in Ukraine with Chosen. That was your. That was where you guys were hunting. Yeah, generally, yeah, and uh, like that's that's. Uh, I mean, we're part of the 59th, so that's pretty much open knowledge. Yeah. Okay, so the, there there are a couple operations that you've you kind of shared some footage, and as an eventuality, you know that footage will make its way over to our website across socials and things like that. But you you kind of have broken that down by Pervo One, Pervo Two, Shovel, which is the companion footage that we just that we just did. People can watch that operation, you know, as a separate video from this. Um, and then what I believe you called One O Nine Samara, Samara, yeah. Yeah, 109 Samara. So first, I, I want to kind of go all the way back to Pervo One. What was what was the purpose of Pervo One? You know, like, what was the shaping ahead of time for that? So was, Pervo One was uh, the stepping off for Pervo One was right when I got to Chosen. So I was in Chosen, I think three days, and Pervo One, the guys were sent out on that one. So I can only assume that the training for that was the same as the training we've done for every other op, where we we get our mission and then we we specifically train for that mission and we'll we'll our leadership i should say our leadership will devise how we're gonna how we're gonna approach it and then we'll change our we'll change our tr- our train towards it you know like we've done going in uh, going in at night we've done everything from like going in mass numbers like our whole our whole unit goes out uh we've done a whole things where it's like uh, we're creeping around at night uh we've we've had guys go do sniper ops we've had guys go just do reconnaissance we've had uh we've had you know all kinds i mean obviously just literally like speeding down a freaking minefield in humvees because who's going to expect that you know and it's we find ways to make it work and we gear our training specifically towards that so like we're we're very versatile so although we're going to talk about kind of these the specifics around these four operations between those there are you know other harassment type raids and things that you guys would do so yeah. from a from a being kinetic perspective would you say that chosen is you know extremely kinetic um i would say know? yeah we're we're a, a very active unit um, i mean i've heard of other foreign units where they, they do one op and then they hang out for like five or six weeks and then they go out do another op and they, ha- they have more downtime than anything with us it's it's you go do your op and then you come back and you get one or two days downtime, and it's like while that one or two days downtime is going on, the leadership is already prepping, planning for the next stop, and then training starts next stop. So per Pervo one, that would have, if my notes are correct, that would have been early June of twenty three. Yes, is that correct? So would you say that Pervo Maisk one was a successful operation? Very much so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, I wasn't on that up, so I have just what what I'm aware of and, and just by just by speaking with the guys and uh, the guy said uh, within 20 minutes they already achieved their objective got into the town 20 minutes they got their objective and they already held it and they wanted to actually push further and it was uh, it, the Ukrainians were like no like you achieved what you came to achieve like you know come back later so between Pervo 1 Pervo Maisk 1 and Pervo mm-hmm. 2 which is what I'd like to talk about next uh, who did you guys maintain control or are you guys there to, to achieve ground and then hand it off? What's that relationship like between you and the, the Ukrainians? Uh, yeah. So our, like what we generally do is we go and take the ground when we're, when we're an assault element, when we're acting as an assault element, we go in, we take the ground and then we secure the ground. If there's a counterattack, we'll hold off the counterattack 
and then the Ukrainians will come up and they'll reinforce the ground and they'll maintain it and we pull back. So so after Pervo one, it was was it handed off? Was this yes. one of those situations where yes. it was handed off? So then we hand it off to the Ukrainians and then the Ukrainians will hold those positions. Uh, if, I mean, they also do their own attacks where they'll still try and get ground. I mean, I'm not going to say that they don't. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, generally that's, we no, like the, no, we I like get it. Well, what, I, what I'm what I'm hoping to understand is the the relationship balance between, you know, like a foreign unit like chosen and Ukrainians, you know, especially you know a, a assault versus holding ground. Yeah. So like with us, we we generally we're not uh, because of how we how we are, we generally don't just do trench sitting, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we're tra if we're just sitting in a trench, we're not training up for the next mission. So we we kind of geared our our specialization into the assault element so uh, like uh, like as a shock troop because then we can go in we can push because we can take that time to train for a specific uh, uh for for a specific objective or a specific operation that gives us the ability to go and take it i mean if we have all of our guys sitting in a trench it's not going to be as effective we can't build that cohesion and build that team bonding where we could be like okay these guys are going to go take this objective you know uh it just it's it's not as effective as us being off being being out of the trenches and to train for those objectives so so when it comes to just kind of sticking with the relationship between yourselves and ukrainians are are the ukrainian you have your commander whom is an american if yes. i'm not mistaken and then he has a ukrainian commander yes when it comes to supply logistics is there interface just with the commander in Ukrainian, how does how does supply work? That's ultimately what I'd, what I'd be interested to understand. How do you receive gear, uh, ammunition? So, uh, like ammunition and, and uh, stuff of that like we get from the Ukrainians. They supply that, right? Uh, excess stuff, I mean, if the Ukrainians do have anything that they can issue to us, they will issue to us. Uh, the majority of the stuff we get, we either buy ourselves or we get uh, through NGOs. Like NGOs are huge and, and very important. Like I, I fully believe people should support NGOs because... They either give us funding to buy the kit we need, or they they'll they'll get the kit themselves and send it to us, and that that is hugely important. Uh, and, and not even just for our unit, but for I mean, they, there's they support Ukrainian units, they support other foreign units. You know, I just I just think that's that's a huge thing is that people should should be aware of that and they should support those those NGOs. But it's uh it's it's kind of tricky how things work. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean I can't I can't speak so much into it because obviously I'm not high enough. In, in into it into the the unit sure. where so I, I a soldier the speaks to soldiering things yeah right what do you at the soldier level feel a lack of equipment or lack of ammunition do you feel <laughs> hamstrung by what you have or uh, what you have access to sometimes it would like i feel like it would be it would be beneficial if if we did get more things that we requested i mean like uh, one thing i've always uh, I, I know all of us, I mean, I can't say all of us, but I know we've definitely been been griping in the trenches being like, we need more counter battery. We need more artillery. We need mortars. We need something. Because now, we're, we're just we, getting hammered with stuff. And it's like, hey, like, like we need, like, you know, we, we need like a mortar system neutralized. We need an AGS neutralized. We need something. And it's, and it's like, like we understand that, especially now politically with what's going on, like there's, there's that, uh, that pinch for 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 supplies and ammo and i know that with ed vika going on like that that obviously was getting a, a large chunk of supplies and it's it's really important that ukraine does get that ammunition because there's lives being lost because you know other countries are just having a fit because they don't want to support it and it's like i get it like not your country not your war yet you know what i mean yeah so i i think the question that I have surrounding, you know, ammunition and supplies from a, a lot of the American populace's perspective, a lot has been provided. But, uh, you know, I think consumption in a peer <laughs> conflict might need to be taken into account. Um, I think there's a perception of corruption, both from a uh, local perspective, i.e. equipment missing, going missing, things like that is is a concern for people. I think corruption from an now, executive perspective is a concern. Now, it's 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 a war. I mean, in every war, you're going to find uh, you're going to find you know corruption at, at some level, and you know there's corruption in, in Russia, there's corruption in Ukraine when it comes to that stuff. I'm there's corruption saying, in the United States, of course. There's yeah. corruption in Canada, you know, like there's there's corruption everywhere. But in every war, there's always corruption. There's always people bartering and selling and back backdoor dealing, and sometimes backdoor dealing is what gets stuff done. 
the quickest and most efficiently, you know, like if you can trade equipment to get what you need, do so. If it, you know, if that helps, if that helps out your unit, especially if you're going to, going on an op, then, you know, get her done. If that keeps your guys alive, I, I, you know, I, I can fully see, see why people do it, but it's like, if you're trying to do it to, to just pad your pockets, which, you know, I've, I've seen, I mean, I know, I know personally of, of foreigners that are over there doing that. That was going to be my next question is it went from a, we, we call them grifters, right? But you know, are yeah, there, I call are, them assholes. Are there, <laughs> do you find that there are almost war tourist types that are oh, really absolutely. there either for clout or oh, there 100%. specifically to make money? I, th- I, th- I mean, what's the difference? What's the point of having clout if you're not there? To, if you're not using your clout to try and make money, in pursuit of the, clout is for it's for financial for, gain for their own gain. Certainly, okay. Know? And uh, you'll see, like, I mean, I the whole, the whole way I even like ended up even in this whole situation was literally because of of a, of a group of these 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 frauds, you know. Uh, what do you mean? I, what do you mean by that? Uh, okay, so without doing specific name drops. I mean, should I just not? I, I, I mean, you can. It's entirely up to you whether or not you do. Well, I'd recommend that you do. You, this, this is the kind of platform for it, but. Okay, so I was in uh, I was in a hospital. This was the second time I got injured, so with the grenade injury, right? So uh, I was in a hospital, and in the hospital, we have this group chat for guys that have been in this hospital. You know, it's outside of Kiev, so it's like guys that have been in that hospital or in the hospital they're they're in this group chat because then when you want to get together you just put in chat like who who's gonna go go for lunch you know and then you just gotta meet up and you go you know some guys different injuries so like guys in wheelchairs it's kind of nice get a guy that's mobile like me that can walk i can push him it just makes it easier so there's a group chat uh then there's guys that were also in that group chat that had previously been there but they were gone so there's this one dude who was claiming that you know he uh he had a boo-boo to his head <laughs> He claimed he had a, a TBI and he should go to this hospital. It's like, man, there's, you know, guys are here because like they've, you know, like lost limbs and stuff. And you're going to come in here with a TBI. Like you can go to anywhere for a TBI. Like with us, if you get a TBI, it's like, okay, man, like, can you kind of just shake it off? Like it's TBIs just happen so often. It's, it's not that we minimize it. It's just like, there's other ways to deal with it. Not necessarily going and taking up a hospital bed when someone more severely injured needs that bed. Do you think you that that, that I mean? just, to, just kind of pause there. Do you think that that is something that, that for example, GWAT veterans, you know, myself included, uh, a lot of TBIs were incurred IEDs, et cetera. But do you think in a peer V near peer at a minimum type conflict that the, the kinetic tempo is just so much higher? that TBIs are happening just that much more. So it's all almost time. normalized all, all the time. Yeah. That's pretty much like it's, and, and it's not that I'm downplaying TBIs. It's just, there's certain facilities that are geared towards those kind of injuries. And there's, there's facilities that are for more intense injuries. So for him to try and go to the hospital where we were at, it was like, everybody's here for an intense injury. And like, there's like, go to a hospital that makes sense. Like don't take up a bed here and, and don't take up funding just because you want to come here, you know, and he already, he already put in the chat that he was, he already made sure like the girls he met on Tinder and knew he was coming back. And it was like, man, like you're scummy. And so a bunch of us kind of like jumped on him. We were just like, yeah, you're, you're a douche. And, uh, ended up chasing him out of the chat. And I, I, you know, I got a bit of shit for that one. And then, uh, he get a, he gets a hold of his friends and I, then they all start harassing me. Like they're, they're threatening to come and kill me on ops. And, and yeah, like, Wait, these are these are these are Forms. other foreign fighters yeah. in Ukraine threatening. Well, they to, weren't fighters. Well, they claim that they've been on ops. One dude claimed I use he the was term uh, loosely. I use <laughs> one dude literally claimed that he held off in a trench against three thousand Russians. Yeah, yeah, I got the video to show you. But they are they are. <laughs> I'm intru- I, I want to watch it. Uh, they are threatening like your life. Yeah, yeah, and so like is that common? From from these guys, yeah, I found out. So because that happened, and then they were they're in these uh, foreigner foreigner groups on Signal, and they they started like just shit talking me, mm-hmm. you know, saying I, you know, just making a bunch of shit, saying I was threatening to kill them. I was like, I don't even know who you are. And through that, uh, all these random NGOs and these random people started messaging me. I was like, who, the, who are all these people? What are they talking about? And then I got brought in the chat, and I seen it myself. I was like, what the fuck? I was like, this guy's an idiot. So I just start refuting everything. And with me, I'm like, you know, he's like making, like saying, saying I threatened to kill him. I was like, where? So I just posted the screenshots. I was like, where? Mm-hmm. Show me where. 
And then he posted one screenshot and it was me telling, telling, you know, buddy that wanted to go to the hospital. I literally said, I was like, sort yourself out, bud. And apparently that's me threatening his life. And I'm just like, Jesus. But that opened up the door because these guys, they had stolen uh, vehicles from three different NGOs. So then those guys were messaging me being like, yeah, this is what he's doing. Like, and, and these guys made so many enemies by stealing stuff, by, by uh, you know, going and doing like a run because they, they were just kind of like driving supplies around. And then it would be like they'd, they'd do a job for one NGO and they'd get paid for it. But then they would hit up two other NGOs be like, hey, we never got paid. You know, we we're kind of like, can you guys help us out? And they would scam. Interesting. And then one thing that we found out uh, later. So like because they're doing all this, it just created like this this whole circle of bullshit that I somehow ended up in the middle of. Yeah. And then everybody was like, why are you guys attacking this guy? You know, like, I mean, for, for, for the majority of it, I wasn't even in the country anymore. I was back in Canada. And these guys were like, oh, this guy came in and he, he raided my house. And I'm just like, man, I'm on the other side of the globe. So, so you're saying that almost from your perspective and from like a, I'm just going to use the, the loose term here. I know it's a sensationalist kind of term, but from your perspective and from a corruption perspective, a lot of that that you are seeing are the foreigners. That are there. From what I what I've seen, I mean, I'm sure that there's a lot of, Ukrainians. Uh, you know, that are, not, I mean, this sure. is this is just the situation that I've become like intimately involved with because they, they, they threw me in it. And I'm just like, man, like <laughs> I got better stuff to do than to, 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 to mess around with you, man. Like you know. I, I'm, you know, it, it's just ridiculous. I mean, but then I found out I know who who who's doing the raids. I mean, I know that Buddy's house got raided three times, and it had nothing to do with me. It was, it was other military units because these guys were stealing military equipment. And I got the videos on my phone that they sent me. And they're like, hey, we just raided this guy's house. Here's the video footage. And you'll see, you know, rockets. You see grenades. You see ammunition. And it's like, this is a time when there's a shortage. And these guys have it. And they're, and they're civilians. They're not military. They should not have it. Interesting. And it's like, obviously, they're getting it illegally. They found drugs in their house. And these are guys that are going over there. And they, they have PayPal set up. They have... Uh, what is it, PayPal? They have a GoFundMe set up. Like you can go to their social media. They got links and they, they do like the, the camera ops, the photo ops. You know, uh, a, a building gets rocketed. They'll go up and they'll have buddy take sh photos and they'll be like, you know, all sad. Like, uh, you know, the influencer nonsense, right? Mm -hmm. And then they post it on online and the people like start sending them money. And people don't know because they're not there. And they think, oh, well, no, these they guys are helping. It, they see it at the face value of what it is rather than the reality, which is really only they're known just, if you're there. They're just scamming people. They're scamming people back home for money. They're scamming people in Ukraine. And the unfortunate side effect of this is like, like the Ukrainian government doesn't like to deal with guys like this because when they start kicking these people out and they start dealing with these guys, these guys then put up a hissy fit. It goes to the embassy. And then the embassy will be like, why are you kicking our guys out? from this country when we're sending you all this aid? Why are you treating our citizens? Because obviously these guys aren't gonna go and be like, yeah, I was selling drugs and stealing weapons. They're gonna be like, oh, I was doing nothing. I was, I'm a victim. Cause you know, that's what these retards do. Sorry, that's what these losers do. Let's bleep that. It's not gonna get bleeped. <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> it's what, if you, you gotta own what you say. <laughs> well, anyway, cause these guys obviously aren't gonna, they're not gonna own up to themselves. Like they, they haven't, they, they just keep bouncing around and they keep, I mean, even now they still say like, I'm going after him. I'm like, man, I'm still not even in the country. Like, you know, get yeah, off pull, my that, pull that in front of you. Yeah, like, just like keep throwing it. Just like there. Then put your mouth over it. Just, yeah. <laughs> no, that'll, that, that's actually going to be great. All right. Yeah. So the, the, oh, beautiful. The, these beautiful. guys, they, they, they just cause issues. And because guys like us, we're always training for ops. We're always like, we're high tempo. So we, like our representation for ourselves amongst like the local population isn't really there because we, we're busy. We're too busy. We're working. You know, the, the time when we get to actually do anything in Ukraine is when we're in the hospital and we get some downtime where we can leave the hospital. That's pretty much it. Other than that, we're working. But then you, these guys, these scammers, they get to run around Kiev, Lviv, wherever they want, you know, and they can tell people all these bullshit war stories that they're superheroes. You know, and, you know, like there's, I know that's that gotta be, that's gotta be frustrating for you. Insanely, because it gives us a bad reputation because the, these are the people that are running around and, and people start to pick up on them that they're frauds. And then when they start to see foreigners, they're just like, oh, it's a foreigner again. I mean, I would be remiss without asking, are there specifics? You know, you know, I, I, can you name drop? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> hey man, you know, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask. Oh, that's, but that's entirely up to you. 
I just don't know if I want to deal with that nonsense after. Hey. But, yeah. I get it. I yeah. get it. But, you know, that's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's, um, you know, it, from my perspective, it, it's all just context, right? You know, I don't know where I'm going with that, but it. I mean, if you want, I'll, I'll show you specifically, like, like afterwards, I'll literally show you. Oh, no, you, you, can't, you can't just show me, <laughs> right? That's not fair. <laughs> That's not fair. Um, so it, it's it's you either tell us or you don't, and that's nah, okay. I'll uh, yeah, I'll hold on because I just yeah. I don't want to be accused of inciting hatred or some other nonsense. This guy's gonna just so, sit there and try and use that as a uh, way to victim. Card. In my opinion, right? In my opinion, matters to like literally one person on the planet, which is me. Yeah. Uh, in in my opinion, they need to be called out, right? Because that is the war tourism. That is detracting from those that are for. You know, better or worse, doing what they believe to be well, right. Well, they're stealing from the war effort. Whether whether if they're stealing funding, that funding that goes to them for them to go out and party and get get drugs and, and you know fucking steal weapons or whatever, yeah. or bribe for weapons. Exactly. That's that's taken away from guys that, that are actually fighting that actually could use that money to buy new kit, to buy night fighting gear, to to buy you know food to, to, to help supplement their. And that's their why. Meals. And that's why, in my when, opinion, when it comes to the weapons they take, those are weapons that should be used on the front line. Like you know, when you got when you got opinion, rockets, when you got ammo, and guys are like, man, I wish I had a rocket. They wish need I had to be ammo. put on blast. That's why yeah. I'm saying that, right? Yeah. You know, so, d damn the drama. You know, ultimately, if it's detracting. And, and, and I'm looking at this from your perspective. When it comes to me, you know, you and I have talked about kind of my perspective on things, which yeah. is which is very much so, uh, I, I wouldn't say neutral ground. I have my own personal perspectives, but from, you know, as a Funker 530 perspective, you know, we are ultimately here to present the, the reality and through the prese presentation of that reality. Well, if you have anything to do with is the truth. Andrew Hamilton or, or Nick Duckworth, I would fucking run away. Stay away from those guys. Well, there it is. There's two. <laughs> well, there it is. I do. I do want to shift back though, because we kind of we kind of got sidebarred on on logistics, and a, you well, know a little bit. So of... we got into that because that's that's how I kind of got into this whole thing, and then because these guys were screwing over NGOs, and then the NGOs just kind of kept talking to me because I don't know. I got a different kind of personality. Right now, I'm I'm just kind of trying to converse about this, and I don't want to I don't know be weird. But when I'm talking to them, like I'm just casual. I, I mean, I, they're people too. They want to talk mm -hmm. about stuff. I talk to them, and I'm, I'm not a, I don't know. I'm a decent person. People like talking to me, and so then these relationships built from them being like, "Hey, just so you know, these guys are screwing you over," and "Hey, this is how they screwed me over." And then when I had a bunch of these people telling me that, I'd be like, "Hey, did you know that your story is the same as this story?" And so then I started just kind of linking all these things together. People are like, "Hey, you're actually a decent dude. You know, is there any way we can help you?" And I was like, well, I mean, not really, but I mean, is there any way I can help you guys out? You know, I've never helped out an NGO. Like, and they'd be like, hey, like, what about this? What about that? And now that's built in a lot of relationships where, uh, you know, I'm very close with with two NGOs. I mean, last night we just, we went out for dinner with uh, with with uh, one of the ladies that runs uh, Ukraine Frontline. Mm -hmm. You know, very nice lady. Uh, it, and she specializes in getting medical equipment for Ukrainian soldiers. You know, she she told me she tries to stay away from the foreign soldiers because go, those guys already get a lot of support. So she tries to focus on on Ukrainian units themselves, and uh, and now she's willing to help out Chosen because uh, I've I've been you know speaking with her and I've been doing a lot like giving her my story and and things that have happened to me. Uh, I would love to give her other people's stories, but that's not my place. Uh, so hopefully, a couple more guys reach out and and they'll share their experience. But uh, just to get medical medical equipment. I mean, and this was all on Reddit, which I, I just recently had to learn how to how to do. I'm still terrible. At I still that don't, I don't know how to do Reddit. Well, I, I don't. I, mean, I don't purposefully don't do Reddit. I'm I'm, I'm I'm I've I've somewhat gotten the knack of Reddit. Uh, Twitter. Reddit, I'm, I'm terrible at that. Reddit the to me is like the asshole of the internet. I think Twitter. I don't think Twitter. I don't think Twitter I was Twitter's stressful. To say that. I find, I find Twitter stressful. I open it up, there'll be like 400 notifications. Well, I, like, I don't, I don't dude, even know what's happening. Dude, I, I love Twitter like so much, right? It is, it, it's such a dog fight with everything that you post because I you're going to- I don't gonna, even know what I'm doing on it. I mean, I, you're, just, you're just I, fending off mobs I don't, I don't at even, times. And at other times, you know, it's I, like- I don't even know how to see, like when people comment on my thing, I don't know how to like drop it down so I can see what people are commenting. I'm just like- Thanks. <laughs> just kind of a gorilla trying to make your way through. I'm just an ogre, man. I, like you can see the stuff. I, I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm just, I got close enough with, with one of the NV, uh, NGOs, uh, Protect the Volunteer. I somehow managed to get them to let me run their Twitter. 
I don't know if it's a good idea or bad idea. It's probably I, a bad idea. I mean, I I'm know. having fun with it. I'm just I'm posting my which is essentially just me shit posting like Russia and Putin and I'm yeah. probably I'm probably gonna end up on a hit list. I don't know. <laughs> well, if you make it if you make it through life without being on somebody's bad side, I feel like you're kind of doing it wrong. Well, I mean, I've already got death threats, so from apparently from people that are yeah, I mean, supposed to be in country doing the same thing that you are. I mean, the dude held off three thousand Russians. I mean, that's kind of. That's not the main reason. I would show it all, man. I would show what it's like to be on the fucking line as 3,000 fucking Russians storm your fucking positions. I would show that. You guys don't want that. You don't want, you don't want the reality. Because the reality is that shit was a fucking zombie movie, bro. I'm impressive. It's a badass. I want to I want to shift to to go back to kind of the operational timeline, right? So so we we did get sidebarred, but I think that it was almost purposeful because that that question about logistics is one that I've I've had for, I, I mean I continue to have, right? You know, because looking at it from an outside perspective in you know, we see the presidential drawdown packages and we see the U, Ukraine security initiative uh security assistance initiative packages. But what we don't see is how and if those things are making it to the ground, and even if they are, how much impact is it making? Because from the outside looking in, it looks like it's a ton of stuff, right? It's a ton of stuff, but you got to think everything is very perishable, right? You know, and then when it comes down to military supplies, the thing with military supplies is they get hit and they get destroyed, right? So you can Certainly. have you like can have war. you like, can have what happens one supply truck, and if that supply truck gets blown up. Which you know, as anybody can see, if you if you go on, I mean, you go on Funker, you can see how many trucks getting smoked with a suicide drone. Well, now everything in that truck is probably destroyed. Yeah, there could be there that could, could be, be five hundred thousand rounds of ammunition on that and truck. Or that something. could support how many units? So it's like, well, now that's that just created a pretty big shortage, right? So when it comes down to that stuff, people look at it and be like, well, that's a lot, and it's like that's kind of a little in a war. Yeah. You know? Do you think, that especially that if they if they're hitting vehicles, that's one thing. If they hit a, if they hit a warehouse. Do you think that that's got so so for the last 20 years, right? The United States and the collective West has been in this unconventional war where we kind of had our way with the place. You can make the argument towards the end of that war that uh executive decision making went awry, but for 20 years we kind of had our way with the place, didn't have too much to be concerned about when it came to like peer capabilities, but now that that there's this Russia this entire peer that is, you know, does have more modern capabilities than the Taliban, the kinetic level is much higher, the operational tempo is much higher, the amount of artillery that's flying, the amount of casualties, both from, uh, you know, a KIA, WI wounded in action perspective, the, the vehicle losses, the scale of that is ultimately making each individual bullet or cartridge and each individual truck just that much more perishable. So when it comes to this kind of a war, our generation might not be used to that. That was a yeah. long question, and, but and I, you gotta, I had to get all the way through and you it. have to think like Russia has 10 times the population, right? They have a lot more meat and, and especially with how they're doing things, like they just don't care. They're just sending meat waves. So Ukraine needs that ammo because now you have, you'll have, you know, eight guys going up against like meat waves every 15 minutes. They send 10 guys out. Boom. Boom, you he, you hear about that, but is that serious? Is is that how yeah. Russia is is yeah. kind of taking when because they are taking some ground at least, right? It, it, but is that yeah, how they're but, doing? But the is wave it, after wave? The cost of it is insane. Like they dumped they dumped like seventy thousand troops. The monetary or the 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 manpower. Cost. I don't think Russia gives a shit about the monetary value of their soldiers. I mean, they've they've been recruiting soldiers. I mean, they're forcibly recruiting soldiers within their own country, you know, criminals and, and just any, anybody that they just don't want in their country. They're just kind of like tossing, you know, the poor, the weak, the old. They just, you know, you're in the army now. Here's a gun. Go. You know, and then, uh, but they've also been recruiting from really poor countries, you know, like Nepal, countries in Africa, India, stuff like that. And that's documented, you know. Excuse me. And then uh, they're, these guys are being told, like, you'll get paid $2,000 a month. You know, U.S. To them, that's tons. Now, these guys don't even live a month to, to get that money because they're just sent out in meat waves. And it's essentially just like, there's the enemy, go walk. And our dudes will be sitting there being like, well, all right, got to defend ourselves. So, like, the whole time, like, these guys are coming in, they're getting hit. And maybe one or two of them will make it up to, like, a, like a, a rally point. 
And then they'll sit there and do that. And then once they got enough guys at the rally point, well, then all those guys will step off and advance further. And then it, it, like it's insanity. So this is this is the kind of modus operandi for Soviet Russia, for Russia now, just wave Meat after waves. wave. And, and it, it's like their their whole purpose is just to try and wear down the supplies, which I mean, with with the U.S. holding back on their supply dump, it's it's kind of happening. You know, like you're going to use up your ammunition, and then eventually you're going to have less ammunition. So then it's like, okay, so like say you're running out of artillery shells. You see, you see a group of that's five guys coming. It's like, do you hold off that artillery round? Do you hold off the artillery to take out those five guys? That's actually or profound. Or do, do you wait until like a group of like ten or fifteen come? The more you think, the more you think about that. That's actually you know somewhat profound. Thinking of it in a in a ammunition, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like um, expenditure perspective is from a casualty rate. Russia, are you saying that Russia is far outpacing Ukraine in the amount of casualties they're taking? But oh, absolutely. in the process of doing that, Ukraine is expending. There's, there's fields, fields full of hundreds of dead Russians just laying out there. They don't care. They don't collect their dead. They don't want to. If you collect the dead, then you got to report them as dead. Then, you know, got to report those numbers. Then you got to pay the, the, you yeah. know, whatever you pay promise. the family. What do they get? Like a sack of onions or something? Like, geez. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, there's the later, I think, yeah, well, is they, the... They're, 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 their payment is they take their family and put them back on the front line. <clears throat> don't got to pay them if they're out fighting, right? <laughs> like, it's just, like, they're, they're out there. Uh, with with us, the benefit with us is, is, and with Ukraine, is that when you're wounded, we actually do try to help you. With Russians, we've seen it where wounded Russians just get left everywhere and they just die. You know, like, they don't they don't care. You know, well, just, I mean, there's documented videos of Russians... You'll have a wounded guy, and Russians go up and take his equipment and leave him out there to die, and they just run away with the, with his equipment. It's just like savagery. It's barbaric. You know, these aren't these aren't disciplined soldiers. Like these, they, they're you know, psychopaths, lunatics. They just they're trash humans. Have you? So I mean, I mean, there have to be some. You know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say elite, but more professional level soldiers. Have you encountered them before? We have, we have, like we've gone up against VDV and stuff like that. Uh, the, we believe that some of the guys in the trench op, because that, like that PKM, shovel, shovel or, or oh, sorry, yeah, shovel. Okay. And uh, that PKM, it you know, like that was a decked out PKM. It had a red dot on it. Like, Is that not normal? No. Like usually, usually, like when they have decked out equipment. I mean, that was that PKM was more updated than mine. Mm. Like mine was from like '68. You know, mine's older than me. <laughs> so like. You know, well, it still works. Right? Yeah, if it ain't broke, don't if fix it. If it ain't it, right? broke, don't fix it. Right, right? Yeah. it still shoots. So, but it's it's like when you come across that, it's like okay, that cut, that's that's from a unit. You know, like is it noticeable on the receiving end when you when you're kind of facing a VDV versus you know a yeah yeah conscript uh, or or the the Storm Z guys? I mean, the discipline level and the fighting capability is is different. The mentality is different, right? Uh, our guys went up against Storm Z and those guys fled. You know, like they describe they just, Storm it's just chaos. Z. Describe Storm Z. So those are the uh, like the conscripted uh, criminals. Oh, they're like, oh, you're in jail. All right, let's go. You want to? If you survive six months, you know, you're out. Right. And then they just send these guys in, and because they're just, you know, the it's you know Russia essentially emptying the prisons. You know, it saves them money. They don't got to pay for them being in prison, but then they also get to use them in the in the war, and they're essentially meat. So they create a buffer with them. So they'll put their Storm Z in front of proper, you know, better trained soldiers. So then there are buffers. So then, like, those guys will get killed. And if they try and run away, like, the other units will just kill them themselves. So it's, like, terrible, terrible situation for the Storm Z guys. Damned mm -hmm. if they do, damned if they don't. They're just a, they're just a meat buffer. So yeah, I got, yeah. I guys have encountered them, and they've, like, on uh, on Pervo 1, they said it was uh, Storm Z guys, and they just slaughtered them. You know, they, they would, they didn't know what they are doing. They didn't have discipline. They, you know, the accuracy's down. They just... It just wasn't uh, wasn't a very good like very good fight for them. So like our guys went in and and it, it wasn't much of a fight. They went in, they took the objective a lot sooner than they than they expected, and they and they just wiped out a ton of ton of Russians to the point where they actually wanted to keep pushing, and the, the Ukrainians had to be like, hold on, hold on. So I, I mean, I have to, I have a ton of questions more sure. about that, but that's actually a really good kind of segue between Pervo One and Pervo Two. Walk us, walk me through, or describe for me kind of the setup for Pervo Two. What was the purpose of that? You know, so what was the information you had? Pervo Two was to take the rest of per Pervo Mysk. Okay. Because of the success we had in Pervo One and the intel we had, 
uh, we were like, okay, we're going to send out everyone. We're all going. And we're going we're gonna to split Provo up into four groups. Each, you know, each section, uh, Canada, we call them sections. U.S., you guys call them squads. You take a quarter of it and you go. And we're, so each, each team had their own objectives and everything. And uh, we had, uh, you know, we had, uh, we had um, phase lines and everything set up. But, you know, we trained for it, you know. And we were like, we're going to take it. We're going to hold it. And this is going to be our, our, this is going to be the beginning of our big push to Donetsk. Did that happen? Getting to Donetsk? Donetsk. No, we, we never made it to Donetsk. <laughs> Russians kind of uh, dumped in 70,000 troops. And, you know, that's. And that was ultimately the big Avdivka offensive that we yeah. see now. Yeah, they kind of, they kind of, you know, countered our, our our thing with superior numbers. So between Pervo One and Pervo Two, they had reinforced the city. Yes. Yeah, so it, so when we pushed off into Pervo Two, uh, very quickly uh, once the operation started, uh, we found out that a lot had changed. What, would, what what did you have any intel? What what would yeah? So we like, originally it was supposed to just be Stormzy dudes up in there, maybe maybe some you know um, some DPR guys, uh, but uh, it, like there's supposed to be like two PKM positions that we had noted, and uh, and you know maybe a fi the fifty calendar bridge and everything, and we were like we knew all this stuff, like a Dishka or a yeah. cord or something like yeah, that. Yeah, uh, Dishka. When we were gonna set up snipers to take that out and everything, and and. Uh, so then we step off, and within ten minutes, we had multiple mass cast situations. And you, this guys, is, you guys started getting chewed up. Oh, bad! And immediately, it was very clear that things had changed drastically. Who was who was managing the position between your success in Perva One and this kind of mass cal event? In Pervo too, you guys kind of kicking off and really not encountering what you expected to encounter. Like who who did the planning? Yeah, uh, we did the planning. Okay, and it wasn't it wasn't like shoddy planning. Like every one of us spent like one or two hours watching the drone footage for your lane. So every like you knew you you had notepads and you'd write down every position you see. But everything. based but based on your understanding of what you were going to encounter prior yeah. and what you did encounter, there's a so gap. We, there's a gap there. Yeah, that there was we're there was never there's never an update or, or like an intelligence update that you know we never got told that there was a swap out. Mm -hmm. You know we never got told that there was a build up, and so like Provo two uh, became kind of like infamous in, uh, I mean maybe not so much here but like in ukraine most units knew, heard about provo 2 because we took like 80 percent casualties chosen took 80 percent casualties. yeah yeah we had uh, like 28 wounded and two kia how big is how big at its biggest was chosen oh chosen has like 100 people now Jeez. we actually we, we got bigger mm. as i said like russia they kind of pissed us off and you know we're coming for them so so at that time you know, 20. I think there's like 40 of us that went on that all. 40, yeah. That would, would take. That would meet the 80% casualty yeah. rate or so there. Yeah. So we, yeah, we took a what lot was your, of What was your role at, that? so that was one of your first stops as chosen. That was chosen. my first stop. That was your first stop. What yeah, was your that role? Yeah, that was a, you know, that was intense. Uh, so my role for that is uh, I was supposed to be doing security for a couple engineers that were doing uh, mine clearing because there's a ton of AT mines. So obviously you want to get the roads clear so that way you, you can get support in, right? You can get uh, armor in, you can get support when we, because well, our intention was to take the village and then we get support. So then the Ukrainians can come in with whatever they want to bring in vehicles and we can, you know, hitch a ride out because driving out's a lot nicer than walking. And uh, we never even got to step out to start because once the, once the other dude stepped off, all four squads were stepped off at the same time to, to do their approach and uh, to begin their assault. And uh, we were supposed to wait for them to start to get engaged and start pushing. And, and uh, once they hit like a phase line, then we would go push out. Because then that means there's a nice buffer. You know, we're no longer a primary target. They're not going to worry about us going out, clearing a couple hundred mines. And um, we never even got to do that. You just took contact? Yeah, well, not not us. Like we were, at this time, we are still waiting in the OP. Uh to step out to go do our job and oh, okay. mass cases were already coming across the radio so guys guys were getting hit from all directions there's 
you know, PKMs fucking everywhere, drones everywhere. Like it was, it was ridiculous. Like, where in Pervo? Where in Pervo? For those that might be like opening up a map or something, describe in Pervo where this Pervo Maisk, where this might have taken place. Uh, generally speaking, so ob obviously because we're fighting on Ukraine side, we would be in the west end of Pervo. Yeah. So we're pushing east. You know, was this like midway through the city or no, you know, western edge? What? Oh, so you guys are starting off on the western edge, trying to yeah. push through. Yeah, and we're just we're just trying to push through the whole town. So we had about like a, I think it was like twelve hundred meters to to left to push through. Then we take the town. Okay. You know, it's not a big town, and uh, our guys. I mean, three of the teams made it only a couple hundred meters before they got bogged down. And they were getting hit with mortars, artillery, drones, lots of drones, drones of all types, like dropper drones, suicide what, drones. Just to just to kind of pause on drones. Drones are talked about a lot right now. What's yeah. what is? This is a loaded question. What is that like? What like drones specifically the FPV types? You know, I know there's multiple types that you can encounter, but I'm talking about the the suicide ones, man. Yeah, those are. Uh... It's hard to explain because you you don't you know it's not like you see them flying around like oh look there's a drone. like you can you really only hear it when it's coming at you and the, the, you can hear the suicide drones because they sound different right because they have a weight load on them they're higher pitch because the rotors the motors are, are spinning faster to, to counter to to make up for the weight right so it's just a higher pitch Wee! Uh, just like in the video that that uh for the shovel op you can hear it. Wee! it's high pitch the the dropper drones are lower pitch like whoa so you can you can hear the difference of them, right? So when you hear that high pitch, you know it's coming and it only gets louder. It reminds me of uh, the Stuka bombers, right? Where they had the the plane, it was the German plane, right? And it, they put the the intentional like the, that scream. So when they're coming in for the dive, it screams oh, right. and creates a tear underneath them. Right. And so like once you start getting hit with those, you're just everybody knows. I mean, it's not just the Ukrainian side. That's that's it's like oh like every side because both sides use the suicide drones. They're yeah. very effective. And it's just like, man. Sound has been used from the air, just, you know, anecdotes. It's, it's sound, has a psychological effect. Sound for has sure. been used from the air by a, a lot of countries, including Russia. So, Russia, back in World War II, they had this unit called Dinacht uh the Night Witches. Yeah, yeah. And the, the all female pilots, they were given these uh, broke down piece of shit biplanes. Yeah, they're expendable. Right. And they would they would shut off the engines so that in the middle of the night when it would be doing this dive run it would create this like nasty sound, and the Germans gave them the nickname the Night Witches yeah. and they were wildly effective, you know. But the you know, the the Soviets still kind of they didn't even really acknowledge their success and it well, wasn't until women, so it wasn't they? until like decades later that they were acknowledged that the Night Witches were like an effective combat unit. Uh, but the 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 purpose that I bring that up, that's the use of that sound. They would purposefully shut those engines off and it would just create this noise coming in. And when we were doing the companion footage, you know, each time that would happen, I've never been attacked by a suicide drone. And I can tell you that's it makes you uncomfortable thinking about it. Yeah, and you only hear them like if it's flying overhead to go find its target, you hear it. If it's uh because they don't they don't fly as high because they're heavier. But if it's coming at you, yeah, man, you only you only hear it for second and a half two seconds yeah and it's it just gets louder and it just what's, slams what when it comes to those suicide drones what's the e efficacy of like a shotgun on the suicide drones not necessarily um, the loitering ones but is there time i mean if you got if you have a guy with a shotgun that's dedicated to doing it almost like an air watch possibly and he, he hopefully he's a good shot uh i mean i know we've used rifles to take down like dropper drones and recon drones yeah uh I'm not sure if anyone has taken down a suicide drone with a with a firearm yet. I think there's I, I think there's footage of that. Yeah, I, I, I bet someone has at least maybe. tried. I guarantee you, someone's tried. Oh, certainly. I mean, if it's I, coming well, at you, you're so probably going to shoot at it. We've seen a ton of footage of unsuccessful shoot downs of um, you know suicide drones, yeah. but um, the most successful footage we you know I've personally seen of shooting down drones with small arms has been loitering. Yeah. Right. The dropper Cause, drones. Because they're, they're slower. I mean, I think the best footage I've seen of a of a guy shooting a dropper drone was uh, it was a dropper drone and it dropped a, I mean, I think it was a mortar round, but I'm going to say it was a grenade just because I, you know, I don't want to 
yeah. pump, puff it up. And when it dropped it, the dude was shooting at it and he shot the munition. It dropped and blew it up right under you. Oh, jeez. And I was like, good shot. I mean, probably luck, but I mean, still, like the fact that it's on video and I was like, oh, good on you. But didn't hit the drone. So, just hit the munition. So not to, I do want to continue kind of yes. down, kind of down the path of the so, operations, and we're and we're going to keep like kind yeah, of yeah. So like the, the, I mean, so like the, the the guys were always saying like they, I mean, you could even hear it on the radio. I mean, it was it was bad. Like you would see. I mean, I was still in the OP at this time, so like I I was watching one of the drone operators. He was I was I was watching his screen, and you could see even on his because he was just flying a recon drone that was mm-hmm. supposed to be like watching out for the guys, and it it. He, even on his, like you could see drones flying underneath his. And it was just like, man. And then uh, eventually we got the go ahead because uh, our squad ended up 700 meters or so uh, down our lane. And uh, and uh, we got the go ahead. Okay, you guys got to go, go you, like you guys are going out. Like we switched immediately to uh, like going out collecting casualties. And uh, we did our first run. We grabbed a couple of guys. Uh, led them back to the OP. So that was only a hundred, like 150 meter run. We didn't even know that these guys were at the first, at the first uh, location, first Ukrainian position. We just went there and we were like, okay, you know, we're not going to say no. Mm-hmm. These guys were like, they were mangled up pretty bad. So we, uh, we got them out of there. Uh, we brought them back to the OP and the OP, like the Ukrainians start jumping on them, medics start jumping on them, start patching them up. And, uh, and I remember looking back at Ryan, I was like, yo, like we're too heavy. He's like, what do you mean? I was like, we got to drop kit. Uh huh. And I uh, to, so, to be able to move, yeah, to and from where you need yeah, to be because there was a lot of guys out there, and I was like, this is we're going to be too exhausted. So uh, myself, uh, J.K. and Ryder, our Ukrainian interpreter, who didn't even have to come out, he came out with us, and we dropped our all of our ammunition, took all of our ammo out, took all of our grenades off us, rifle. You know, all we had on us was our helmet and our plate carrier. And uh, then we ran out. No rifle. No, no. I mean, in hindsight, it kind of fucking feels stupid. But <laughs> it's it's it, it, at the time, well, I wasn't of, thinking about what was best for me. I was like, if... If you think about, yeah, kind of your purpose for doing that. going out to go collect guys. I was like, I wasn't going out to try and engage. And, and I was like, I need to be as light as possible to move as quickly as, as possible. And then we started making our way out. And uh, before we did, uh, I made sure I was looking at the at the drone operator's uh, screen. So he was flying over top of over top of Delta. And I had him zoom out and I memorized everything I was around because they were in the grass. I was like, we're gonna be walking, the grass was high, you know, a couple feet tall. So they're laying down in the grass, you're not necessarily gonna see them, right? And they're probably gonna be quiet because there's an enemy all around them, you know? So I was like, okay, the best way of trying to find them is to memorize everything that's around them. And then once they hear English, they're probably not going to shoot us. You know, mm-hmm. if they hear Ukrainian, I mean, they might not know it's Ukrainian. They might think it's Russian. It just, you know, bad Scooby. So I memorized the area and we start making our way out. And I think we made it 40 meters past the first Ukrainian position and a Ukrainian stepped on a landmine. Blew off a nice chunk of his face. He stepped on a landmine and it blew I, off I a think, chunk of his I face. I think what ended up happening is that he stepped on like a, some debris in the ground and it hit the landmine. So oh. I remember, I remember looking at him and the guy was just like walking and just like, boom. And you just see the explosion right up, right up in front of him. And I was just like, what the fuck was that? I was like, was that a dropper drone? I was like, what, what just happened? And the guy just grabs his face, starts screaming and runs, gone. So we pull back, we're like, oh fuck, what do we do? Well, we gotta go. All right. So the engineers start doing like the, they got the rope with the hook. So anytime you had to go on the grass, they started doing that. They just started hooking the grass and be like, okay, like there's no booby traps, you know, no wires. And then we started going across uh, the rubble, right? Up and down over the rubble. And while we're doing this, we start getting shot at from everywhere. <laughs> like pretty much the whole approach. Mm-hmm. We're just getting lit up from somewhere. And then uh, I remember looking up and I look at JK and I'm like, hey man, radio up and uh, see if the drone above us is friendly. He's like, yeah, okay. Calls back. He's like, hey, uh, is uh, the, the drone above us, is this a friendly drone or an enemy drone? You're like, all right, wait, when? Comes back. Yeah, that's a friendly drone. We're like, okay. And I was like, hey, JK, what about the other one? Calls back. Hey, is there a second drone? And they're like, what second drone? Oof. I was like, oof. <laughs> it's like, oof. Well, we're like, okay, so which one's friendly, which one's not? Like, Just kind of flipping a coin on which yeah. one you shoot at? or Well, no gun. Oh, you did? 
<laughs> just, just, hey, what's up, buddy? Throw and rocks I'm, at it or something. Uh, you know? Yeah, I'm not that good of a. Th- I don't play baseball, right? I can't throw a rock up 100 meters. But uh, I mean, there was a couple of Yukis that were out there with us, and they had their guns on them. So it's like, okay, it wasn't. Uh, but you know, they they didn't shoot. We were just like, well, they see us. Yeah. And so we we just kind of kept moving, and uh, we end up making our way. Once it, it starts hitting nightfall, and we're moving slow, right? Because anytime we're on the grass, the, the engineers are trying to do a pull. Just, you know, it's not going to stop us against mines, landmines, but it, if there's a booby trap, it might catch that, right? So we're we're up and down, and, and then we get probably about halfway, and you can tell that the Yukis are losing their nerve. They don't want to keep pushing, right? What, what was, When you say you can tell, what was, like, the indicator? They would stop, and then they would start yelling at each other. Oh, and then my interpreter, I'd, I'd look at him and be like, yo, tell them to shut the fuck up. Because mm-hmm. every time that they'd yell at each other, well, that gave away our position. And then you would just see machine guns start lighting up us. So like laying down and you see trace rounds fucking flying over. I'd be like, well, I can guarantee you there's a lot more than two PKMs out here. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, we got four or five kinda, of them shooting at us at once. Kind of blew that intelligence you had yeah, out of the water. Yeah. So I remember okay. telling uh, telling her, uh, telling Ryder, I was like, yo, if you don't, if you don't, if, you, if these guys don't shut up, I'm like, I'm telling them I'm going to beat their ass. Like, I will fuck them up. I was so mad. Because it's like, man, like, they're closer than me and you are. And they're yelling at each other. Mm. It's like, whisper. Shut the fuck up. We're going to die because you're yelling at each other. Like, learn. Every time you yell at each other, we're getting shot at. And this probably happened like a dozen or so times. And then there was times where they were just like, no, like, we're not going any further. And I was like, fine, I don't care. I'm going. Yeah. Like, you need to come with or not. I'm like, I don't care. I'm like, we're not far enough. Because, I mean, they would say, like, we think we passed them. No, they, there's no way they came out this far. I was like, no, we haven't hit the landmarks, the land features that I memorized. And uh, so I was, like, I was like, they're either coming or, like, no matter what, we're going. I'm like, I'm not leaving my guys out there. I was like, they need us. You know, we have to go. That's just how it is. We have to go. Mm. And meanwhile, like, I don't even have a gun on me. I don't even have a grenade on me. I don't even have a magazine on me. I didn't realize I had my knife on me, but I didn't realize that till later because uh, JK had his GoPro. So like you can see me running around, my knife is just like bobbing around. Just dangling. Me. I had no idea it was even there. Yeah. You know, I completely forgot about it. And uh, so we're running around Purvo and we get, we eventually make it to the to the area where I memorized the features. And uh, and we found the guys. And so we jump on them. And uh, at that time, uh, there was two KIA and the other guys were wounded. Mm-hmm. So the guys that were walking wounded, it was like, okay, good. Like you, like, and these are, go. these are, these are chosen yes. walking wounded. Okay. Yes. So we had uh, two chosen KIA and two, and uh, there's a few uh, chosen that were just wounded. Mm-hmm. And it was like, okay, if you can walk, start walking. If you can walk and help each other, help each other, start walking. I was like, we're going to walk along to the, onto the, the, the wounded. Uh, there's one guy. Uh, so Ukrainians jumped on the, the KIAs. And they started carrying them back. And so myself and Ryder jumped on uh, one of our wounded. He was unable to walk. He was pretty badly wounded. Very badly wounded, I should say. And uh, so we jumped on him. And we started carrying him back. And we're following the Ukrainians. And it was terrible. I remember looking at looking at Ryder. And I'm like, yo, this is a bad idea. Because I just, even though we came with the rubble, it was, it was exhausting, right? Just the stress and just moving. And, and like, you know, being shot at, like, it's... You burn a lot of energy, like it's exhausting, right? Your adrenaline's constantly going. You just and so we were like, all right, well, we know it's a minefield <laughs> because we watch Ukrainians step on the minefield, and we're like, okay, let's. Uh, uh, you know, I, I thought it was like, I mean, it, if we follow the Ukrainians, I mean, at least they'll clear the mines, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So we're like, all right, let's let's go. So then we uh, we start following them. And then JK, uh, JK's walking on the rubble. He's like, what the fuck are you guys doing? We're following Ukrainians. He's like, it's a minefield. We're like, yeah. Like, Get the fuck out of the minefield. <laughs> you know, it's just like, and yeah. it's, it's, it, it took him like, like pretty much looking at us like we're, we're, we're idiots for us to like click and be like, yeah, this is a stupid idea. So we, uh, JK did a poll and we, we brought CB back over to the, to the rubble and we started moving down the rubble. And that's exhausting. Up, down, up, down, and you're trying to stay low, right? And we moved them uh, and we, we found this crater and we're like, okay, we need to take a break. And, and, uh, and uh, he's, he's very cold. He's, and so we're, we're holding. We're in, and uh, Jake, he's like, I'm going to go get a thermal blank. I'll be right back. Mind you, 
we never really thought about how far we were. We never thought about like time-wise how far we were or distance-wise. Honestly, I'm not going to lie. I thought we were 100 meters away from the, the Ukrainian position. I had no idea how far out we were. How far were you? Uh, I, I think when I looked at the map, we were at least 700 meters away from the nearest friendly, from the nearest Jeez. friendly position. And you got to think all sides of us was enemy. Yeah. Like, and you don't have a rifle. No, no. And at this point, there's myself, Ryder, and the casualty. And there's the mean, three of us are alone. I don't mean to armchair quarterback, but that sounds pretty stupid. Yep. Granted, I, I can recognize and understand the mission I that have, you were on. I have made better life choices. Yeah. 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 At the time, it seemed like the most effective. The most idea. logical way for you to get to point A to point B is to be as light as possible. So yeah. you can be as fast as possible. Yeah. However, comma. Um, yeah, at that time yeah. when there was three of us alone and the Ukrainians had left and they were the only ones with rifles. And there's there we are with our casualty and we're just like, man. And he's like, he's like, I'm cold. So I was at one time, like I'm actually laying on top of him just to try and help keep him warm. And, uh, and then I remember I'm sitting there and behind me, so there's this wall, it's maybe like a foot high, right? It's just like a rubble from a building. And we're in this crater from from uh, probably an artillery round. So that's where he's at. And then Ryder's by his head. I'm, I'm by his feet. And I've got my back up against this wall. And I can hear voices. Now, where I was facing, when I was, my 12 o'clock. So where I was facing. So it was myself and then a casualty and then Ryder. So that direction. And behind them was the Ukrainian lines. Anything behind me is Russian. So I can start hearing voices. So I'm, you know, telling, telling Ryder, I'm like, yo, shh. Don't say anything. And he's like, why? And I'm point, tapping on my ear. And so he starts listening. And we, we tell we tell her casually, hey man, you can't talk. Can't moan, can't do anything. Just shh, 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 shh. You know? <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I push my back up against this thing and I can up against this little this little shitty wall. And I'm grabbing these rocks, these pieces of rubble next to me. And I'm just like, man. You know, I like there's people coming. And I could hear there's this one piece of metal. It was like a, a part of a door for a car. And it was like on the rubble, but it was on the path. And anytime any one of us walked past it when we went up and when we came back, it made a very distinct noise, right? And we heard it like a dozen, a dozen times going in and coming back, right? So I was like, I was like, man, and I could hear it like ting, ting, ting. And I was just like, you know, that's not, you know, that's not the wind. That's someone coming. And I was just like, mm, this is bad. This is bad Scoobies. We don't got a gun. And so I just started grabbing these rocks and I'm just thinking like, and you're going to hit somebody with the rocks. That's, is that your thought process is well, you're going to, I was going to, I was going to throw it and think and hope that they would think it's a grenade. Oh, fair right. Enough. You know, grenade, thud, you know. You know, hopefully and you know, give them a bit of panic. And then if need be run up and start bashing, doing that with a freaking rock. If I could at least cause some sort of chaos, cause something, maybe I could get one and of the you guns still don't and I remember, do something. And you still don't remember that you have your knife. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It would have been nice if somebody would have told me that was there. Mm -hmm. I mean, Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> would have been nice if you had your rifle. Would have been sweet if I had my rifle. That would have been a really good idea. But mm -hmm. honestly, if I had my rifle, I probably would have, would have shot shooting, and that would have been even worse. You would have uh, Mind you, attracted that's, that's a lot hindsight, of attention. Right? That's hindsight. Yeah. I could Because uh, what ended up happening is they, they got maybe like 20 meters away from us, 15, mm -hmm. 20 meters away from us, and uh, they started shooting. They threw like three or four grenades just like in your general direction. They just started pop, 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 popping off rounds. And we're just sitting there and I've just got these two rocks in my hand. And then it goes kind of quiet. And then you hear like a suppressed rifle. And I'm just like watching the dudes and I'm like listening. I'm trying to listen for footsteps, see if they come any closer. And then it goes quiet. And we're just sitting there, we're like, we're not moving. Like we can't risk standing up. There's no cover. There's nothing. Like the, 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 the only cover we have is the, this crater that we're in. You know, I got, I got like six inches of concrete that I, my, my shoulder blades are pressed up against. And I'm like, this, this, is, this is it. Like, we stand up. They're going to see us. Mm -hmm. You know? When I, when I could throw a rock at them, they're just going to, I'm going to, like, sick guys hose me? Like, no, man. Like, so we had to stay there. You know? Lay low. Be as quiet as we can. You know? And uh, <laughs> after a little bit, JK just comes wandering out. <laughs> hey, guys, what, the, what are you guys doing? <laughs> I was like, get them, get them down. Grab them, like, pull them down. Like Russians right back there. He's like, oh man. He's like, why don't you guys see anything? I was like, the feet suburb is being quiet, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, shh. You could have told me. But it's like, yeah. it's like, okay, like if he's able to walk up, like these guys are probably gone. 
Yeah. You know, they didn't dip out the same way they came because I didn't hear that metal, right? I, and we, like, honestly, I didn't even hear him leaving. Heard him approaching. Heard him, like, the rubble, like, the, the crunching and everything, the movement of the rocks. But nothing on them leaving. Mm-hmm. So we had no idea. Like, I was, it was nighttime, right? Night travels a lot further. So we were, we were listening for that. Nothing. But when JK came up and obviously he wasn't engaged, it was like, all right, I mean, it, let's get the hell out of here. So we threw the thermal blanket on, on our casualty and picked him up and just started going. And yeah, I feel like forever getting him back. Got him, uh, got him back as far as we could. And then I uh, made sure the, the walking wounded that came back, they were at that first U- Ukrainian position. So we got uh, our casualty back to the OP, came back and went to the uh, to where those guys were. And I didn't even know that they were there. We went, uh, Ryder and I went there and they just kind of like stumbled out being like, hey, like, can we leave now? You guys already left. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, you know, but I mean, it's confusion, right? And these guys got blood loss, so I can fully understand like why they're a little out of it. And, uh, and uh, I was like, yeah, I got to remember grabbing one guy. And uh, he was actually that team, our, our team's medic. Awesome dude, phenomenal guy. Kept kept these guys alive. And uh, I was like, yeah, or, yeah, man, let's let's go. I'll lead you down. I'll lead you through the path. And he's like, okay. So I got him on my arm. And we're trying to we're trying to get him going. And as we step off, artillery, <laughs> maybe thirty meters in front of us, right on the path. I look at him. I'm like, yeah, maybe we wait a bit. He's like, yeah, let's wait a bit. <laughs> go back. And we're just sitting there, and we're just like, all right, how long do you think we should wait? Mm-hmm. And then like a Ukrainian comes running down the path and he's just like, what are you guys waiting for? Or, or I think it was JK came running down. He's like, what are you guys waiting for? We're like, man, it just got blown up. It was like, if they're launching artillery again, like we're not, I'm not going to bring these guys through because we're not moving fast. I don't they, like, you know, if it was me, I could just run it, but I'm like, I'm not going to bring, you know, I'm not going to try and, you know, that's too high threat. Just yeah. not, not good Scoobies. So then we grab, uh, we grab the dudes and we bring them back. And then uh, we make sure uh, we go back and we grab, uh, one of our KIA, and we bring him, we bring him back, and uh, we bring him back to the OP. At this point, the OP is just full of casualties, and uh, they start evacuating these guys. What are you guys using for evac? Uh, just a truck, or do you have one one threes? Do you have what do you have? whatever whatever is available? Uh, oh, okay. I mean, but that's the thing is they can't even come down the road because we didn't get to clear the anti anti tank mines. So you got to walk these guys out. Oh, so you're you're hot footing it with the, yeah. with your casualties from until it, your until OP, it, which is also serving as your casualty collection point. Yes, and and it's so like we're we're bringing these guys out, and it's you know going like a couple kilometers, and then the vehicles can then the vehicles can mm-hmm. load up and get them out of there. And during the nighttime, it's not as bad. Uh, and once so once we got back there, and we thought uh, everybody you, well, was inside. Hold on, just to pause for a second, yeah. do you find yourself? To be better equipped to fight at night than the Russians are, most definitely, yeah. And well, and not only just equipment wise, but training wise. So a lot of people at night they want to go to sleep, right? They 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 don't have the discipline to stay awake to fight that, you know. So let them sleep. Just means they won't wake up, <laughs> right? So uh, they uh, our guys start medevacking dudes out. And uh, we come back, and because uh, Ryder and I remember, we, we said, we're going to make sure that we're the last two guys out. We're going to make sure everybody's back. And uh, we we're like, is there anybody left? And we got told, no, oh, pretty sure everybody's, out, everybody's in. We're like, all right, cool. We go back, and we find out that uh, one of our KIA, the guys, the Ukrainians are car- carrying one of the KIA, stepped on a landmine. So they had to leave. They left him out there. Use a stretcher they were using to carry his body to evac the Ukrainian get him out of there and uh and when they did that obviously one of our guys bodies was left out there so we were in the OP and they were like okay we need six guys so uh myself JK pretty sure Ryder and a couple of the guys volunteered to go back out and so we went out and we went and uh, we had to go find his body so we waited till we had a little bit of sun because at the time we didn't have any MBGs on us. So we're waiting for a little bit of sun. Not too much sun. We're, you know, there's going to be a bunch of drones in the air because, I mean, we it's not good. Like at that time, like we're, all of us are exhausted. You know, you, you, we haven't slept in well over 24 hours by now. And, you know, dehydrated, haven't eaten. You know, we're just, 
They're like, okay, we gotta, we're going out mission oriented, get him, find him. We didn't even know where his body was. Um, they even sent up a drone. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a thermal drone or not, but they sent up a drone to try and see if they could locate his body. And we were walking and as we were walking, uh, we just stumble across it. We're like, oh, there it is, you know? And uh, he was in the grass. So uh, JK doing what JK does, he's an engineer. He uh, does like the booby, booby track, booby trap check, right? Crawl on top, roll sideways, right? Yeah. Because if the booby trap that we didn't know if the Russians got up to it or not. Because we- well, oh, So when you say the booby trap check, you mean you're checking- His body. His body to see if Russians had- Booby trapped it. Are they, is that a common occurrence? Yeah. Yeah, they like doing that, especially to foreigners. What do you say, especially, is that just experiential? It's, yeah, so with us, like, we we don't like to leave our fallen behind. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, like, like we, there's been ops where, like, ops will be done specifically just to go try and collect the body. So it's just become, like, a standard thing where they'll they'll target it, right? So they know you're they know you're going to come back for foreigner bodies. So because they know that they're using yeah, it's it's I mean it's we'll we'll make we'll 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 try and do like to the best of our capability. I mean it's not always achievable, right? Some of them it's it's they know yeah. there's going to be an attempt. Yeah. So uh, you know so obviously we have to check, and uh, and even when we were by the body. Uh, we got our on the radio they're like hey no there's the body is still like 100 meters away like we see it and we're like no it's right here and they're like no no it's it's still ahead we're like we are literally looking at it you know he's right here like who are you looking at and that was my question i was like i was like yo if they see if they see someone 100 meters away that's not our guy mm -hmm. like if they see someone that's not a ukrainian that's not our guy that's a bad guy i was like we got to get him we got to get the fuck out of here so we loaded him up, and by this time, like my, I remember this, my 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 grip strength was destroyed because you had been evacuating people. So uh, I mean, I know I wasn't the only one, but it was just certainly was, man, man, my forearms were wrecked, and uh, so we were rotating on on and off the the stretcher, and we're we're trying to carry him. I mean, it's it's exhausting. We move maybe you know twenty thirty meters, set him down, rotate around. Like even if it's just going from left side to right side, it's still something, right? And we pick him up, we keep going. And we get back to the OP. The sun's up by now. And they come out, they're like, all right, and they start handing out kit. I gra grab this, put this on, put this on. At this time, I'm already wearing, I'm wearing some, so I'm wearing my plate carrier. I don't even have my gun or nothing. Go in, they're like, grab your shit. So I start, just grab my backpack through mags that I thought maybe were mine, mm -hmm. grab my rifle. And then I get handed like another plate carrier. I'm already wearing my plate carrier and someone else's plate carrier with their with their grot and with so now I have a gun actually at this time. I, I on the way back. Oh, do I you have a gun now? Yeah, okay. yeah. That's wasn't good. A, wasn't mine. It was someone else's. <laughs> well, hey. So for, for the last little bit, I, I walked 150 meters with someone's gun. So. <laughs> hey man, it's Dobra. better than a sharp stick. Yeah, okay. Dobra. I was I was totally I was totally prepared. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and and I mean now that's daytime, the you Russians start you know dropping mortars and, and artillery and just sporadic at the op generally in our area and we're just like oh fuck and uh and then we get told all right we're stepping off grab all the shit it's coming with us yeah so it's like fuck and this is my first op I, this is my re reality check and i'm just like man i was like can we take a minute and like now that i look back like i wanted to just, like it, if i was on that op now with the experience i have now i would have slapped a living shit out of myself mm -hmm. and uh and uh we step off I was like, okay, well, like, how far are we going? Where are we going? They're like, we're going. Just go. Start going. Step it out. And I'm like, geez, why are we stepping it out? I remember, I remember just like, man, I, I was just thinking, I'm so tired. But there's another guy. There's, oh, it's always helpful when there's another guy that's also tired. And you're just like, well, fuck, I'm not as weak as him. And I just made sure I always kept myself in front of him. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, man, I'm so freaking exhausted. And like, I was dehydrated. I, I, I mean, I was, I was literally drinking water from other guys' camelbacks. Cause like, I, you know, I just, I was done. I was, I was just toast. And uh, and we're walking, and we get back to like our uh, we get back to the cash like to the evac point, you know where the Humvees can come up and pick us up. And I remember we get up to the Humvee and we're all exhausted. We see the Humvee, we're like, yes, everybody's throwing their kid in, you know, throwing everything in. We're just dumping it. And uh, and I remember I just like step back while everybody's unloading their kit, and I just like laid on the ground for a second. Mm -hmm. The moment my head hits the ground, I'm just laying on the road. Boom. Oh, jeez. 
artillery lands right like maybe 30 meters away from us. And the Yukis, I remember the Yukis like, you know, yelling at us, like trying to get us to speed up. I was like, man, these guys need to chill. Like they've been, they've been hanging out in Humvees. Like we've been, you know, getting our asses kicked. And, uh, and then the thing blows up and I was like, oh, well, I mean, that, that explains that. And so like everybody jumps in. Meanwhile, because my dumb ass was laying down, I'm the last one in the Humvee. You know, JK's on the outside of the Humvee, literally holding on to, to nothing. Like just onto the, the armored panel. And I'm on, I'm the last one in. There's no tailgate. And I'm just like, man, so I, I, I got nothing to hold on to. Like we got, we got our casualties or the KIA's body there. One guy's on top of him. So his body doesn't come out. And then I'm sitting there on the, the, the where the tailgate ought to be. And I got my foot wedged where like the, you know how it's got like that weird circle trailer hitch thing. I'm trying to wedge my foot into there. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know? the, the, the claw. Thing yeah. That, yeah. So I'm trying to wedge my foot in there because I have nothing to prevent me from sliding out. My hands are split on the, on trying to hold the armor panels jk is trying to hold me in because he's falling out and then a guy behind me is holding like the the strap on the back of my my plate carrier yeah and i'm just like constantly sliding out and i just be like i'm sliding and then i just feel someone tug me and i'm just like i'm sliding and feel someone tug me and i'm just like man and these guys are driving this is actually probably the, the most bizarre thing i've seen in a while we're doing like a buck 20 brown getting the hell out of there you know because they'll chase you with drones and they'll smash you with a with a suicide drone it's, you know nice nice rich target full of dudes so they just beeline it and i remember like <laughs> we're all freaking exhausted we just got like smashed you know like just physically emotionally just drained drained cycle just drained all of us mm -hmm. and i see this like little tiny you know slightly larger than like a smart car just this red car just mm -hmm. driving towards the place we're bahan away from i was like what the fuck is going on here man I'm like do you guys not know like there's a war there yeah, and there's like dur, 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 dur. I'm just man in my in my head movie, blew my mind in my head movies right now I have the Jetsons you know yeah and just this tiny little car and I was just like I was like man like did I just hallucinate that because it's like all you see is like you know I mean who was it you know was it? Well, just somebody know. it wasn't it wasn't military I mean just, oh okay we're not gonna be bahan around the front in a freaking little red smart car <laughs> so this is the tail so this would be the this is the tail end of pervo one you're pulling this back. is the tail end of pervo two or pervo two excuse yeah. me yeah so you guys are pulling back yeah so then uh kind of licking licking your wounds really well i mean we're licking everybody's wounds uh, well that That's you're bad. being the collective then, like i remember getting back to base and uh i got out of the i, I was so exhausted we get in a vehicle we're driving back to base and i just pass out mm -hmm. oh yeah, I'm sure. And we get back to base and I open up the door and I just kind of stumble out and there's maybe, I think there was 13 of us left on base. And that was including like new guys that showed up the day that we stepped out for the op. And guys came to me like, hey, you're alive. And I remember my, my first response was like, I'm sorry to disappoint. Like, you want me to go back? Like, yeah. how, like, like, what do you want me to say to that? And then they told me, they're like, no, we got told you were killed. I was like, oh, is this when you were, when you went to go and find. So I spent, because Ryder and I spent so much time away, oh, we never actually went inside the OP. We just go to the door and hand off so whoever. You, you were so out of sight, out of mind. They I was, I was gone for like, like a solid 10 hours or so. Yeah. And I guess a body showed up that got hit in the face with a sniper round. So his face was just pretty much, you know, gonzo. And because I was a new guy, nobody really knew me. They didn't know my tattoos. They didn't know, you know, they were just kind of like, this guy kind of, he's got a beard. You know, he's white. He's kind of built like him. He's ish. Yeah. And the Ukrainians are like, it's not one of us. So it had to be you. So they're like, it's the only units out there where the Ukrainians and us. So dirty, they're like. Dirty P. Yeah. The dirtiest of P. And uh, <laughs> I'll have to explain that one. <laughs> so, uh, so then uh, they went through kind of like a nominal rule, you know, checklist. Okay. Yeah. Where is everybody? You know, they're like, dur, 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 dur. and then they're like, okay, well, where's Dirty Pete? Everybody's like, oh, I haven't seen him in a while. It's like, nobody knew where I was. And then they're just like, well, I guess, I guess that's him. And so then, you know, hey, what's up? I kind of like show up and they're all just like, who the fuck was that guy? Then? Yeah. <laughs> so then who is the guy without uh, his face? It ended right? up being, uh, being a Ukrainian. Okay. So they, uh, yeah. And so I just, yeah, I remember that was my first stop and, and, uh, it, that was a really big gut check. I remember that, like, I think all of us were emotional. I, I, I remember sitting down and I just like broke down 
And I think the one thing that, that really hit hard is a conversation that I had with Dubs before, uh, before we stepped off. And it's really bizarre. It's, it's, you know, I'm sure, you know, anybody that's been in the military that's been in combat, they've, they get like this weird feeling, you know, like the bad juju when you know something bad's going to happen. Mm. And it was really odd. Dubs was like, hey, man, can you help me put this, uh, put this radio in my pouch? I was like, yeah, sure, I guess. I mean, the pouch was like right here on his front and like, sure, I'll help you put it in this punch, in this pouch that you can very easily put it in yourself. <laughs> you know, it's a radio pouch. You got to take it out, put it in the it's, All right, man, sure. I thought it was a little odd. So I was just like, whatever. So I followed him like into the OP, into this one side room. And he's like, hey, man, uh, make sure you're ready to like run up and lead the section. And I was like, I was like, nah, man. I was like, you're leading the section. I'm not taking that from you. He's like, nah, man. He's like, I, I think this is going to go bad. He's like, I got a bad feeling about this one. He's like, he's like, if something goes bad, I need you to come up and take over. So he's, he's almost preparing you in a yeah. way just because he has a feeling. Yeah. And, and if he's, cause he was a section commander, right? Okay. So if he's saying that, that like, uh, cause I was supposed to be his section two, I see on this op, but I mean, I ended up having to go back and do the demining. Mm -hmm. So, so he was, he was, it was, it was very bizarre. And I was just like, man, I was like, don't be putting that out in the universe. I was like, you're going to be fine. Everybody's going to be fine. I was like, you're, you're a fucking solid leader. I was like, you got this. I was like, you, you're going to make sure the boys are good. You're going to be good. Boys are going to come, going to be good. You're all coming back, you know? And, uh, yeah. Uh, dubs didn't survive that, that off. He's one of your two KIA. Yeah. Yeah. Good dude. Good dude. I, you know, I didn't get to spend enough time with him, but like the time I did spend, it's, you know, you kind of look back and you wish you were able to spend more and learn more from him. The guy mm -hmm. was a wealth of knowledge. You know, I, I just a ton of experience. Brilliant man. So, so that was that was Pervo two, and between Pervo one and Pervo two, you know, Pervo Mysk one and Pervo Mysk two. Yeah, uh, that's really June, right? So that's yeah. June twenty twenty three. Yeah. Now that'll end up leading us to kind of talk a little bit about shovel op. Right? Yeah, yeah, it kind but, of leads because. Uh, yeah. But before we do that, I have to pee. Yeah, yeah, all right. yeah. I have, I have to be real uh, bad, so we're gonna pause. Let that for be a, a solo sport. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah. So we're gonna hit pause, and uh, be right back. All right, we're back. Uh, thanks for that. So right before, right before we broke for a uh, pee pee break because I have the uh, bladder of a, a ninety year old. Um, we had just kind of finished up talking about per vote two. Yeah, yeah. And that was you guys and, got you guys got submitted for a medal. For yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Uh, there was other guys that also did uh, from other sections. Uh, hopefully, they'll get a chance to tell their their stories of what uh, what they went through. Uh, I mean, there's there's so many amazing guys that are in chosen. It's it's yeah, it's just a huge collection of of, of just solid dudes that I would always love to fight with. Um, but it also it also kind of leads us into. The next operation. The next operation yes. would have been shovel. The well, one. So after after uh, Provo two, we kind of the focus then switched from training to now we got to take care of the casualties, make sure that they're okay, uh, get them the hospital bags and let guys heal up, and then we we're low on manpower, so we just kind of went to take a break. I mean, those of us still on base, like we 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 maintain training. We still went and uh, and we we had new guys. We had to keep keep them up to speed, right? And uh, we did what we could with what we could, you know. We had a couple more guys come in, and then uh, after after a few weeks, we had guys come back from the hospital that had minor injuries, and they were ready to go again. And then, uh, you know, new new mission, new op, and we started training for it. And then, uh, uh, shovel op was the next big op, which is where the video comes in. Yeah, so, that's the the companion footage that we did yes. where we, where you broke down. You know, kind of almost play by play, yeah. what happened during that? But that took place where, where, and from a time frame, you know, where, where, and when was so was sh shovel up? Uh, shovel up was in August, and that is south of uh, that was in the in the field south of Provolmisk. So between June, the end of June, which would have been your your first op, but per, what you call Pervo or Provolmisk yeah. two, then you have July, which was kind of casualty care as you describe it, train and maybe train up for the following yeah. operation. And then in August you have 
that big long video that most people that are probably watching this have seen uh, and if they haven't again go check the companion footage of assaulting that russian trench line yeah yeah and you know for for us like guys wanted to get their payback right like it was like all right fuck this we're going and uh and so then uh shovel came up and uh this was my first time being a pcam gunner i mean i've been a ma machine gunner before but I mean, obviously never P camera. How do they, how do they pick like roles? Do you kind of just raise your hand and it's something like that? So when a position is available, like we have a heavy weapons dad, so these are all guys that have you know they've been doing heavy weapon stuff. Like that's just kind of their 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 thing they like to do. Not a lot of people like to do it because it sucks and it's heavy, it's very encumbersome, and it's exhausting. And you get yelled at all the time because you're always moving slower than people because because you, because it's heavy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and people. They, they forget that like keep up and it's like oh yeah i'm, I'm like 350 i got this heavy ass so. machine gun I'm, I'm coming i promise <laughs> you know i'm trying yeah. to make my way through this trench and i'm getting caught on everything like you know give me a it's not ball. a wieldy kind of no it sucks balls uh if if anybody watch it well, i mean if anybody hangs up me in a trench while i'm moving on 99 percent of the time i am cursing and swearing that freaking gun and i'm saying i will never carry the pkm again and the next stop there I am but the then you are, then you are there again with the pkm <laughs> yeah yeah because it's like it's like nope this is this is my thing yeah and uh but I, I, so i became the pkm because the guy that was pkm he was going on he was going home on leave he was taking some time off and like his it was already submitted and everything and he was like the, so he was supposed to go on shovel but then shovel got delayed uh, because of, uh, i think it was like rain or something like that and you know, trying to rip up in humpies in the mud. I mean, if we get stuck, that's a it's a really shitty time to get stuck. You're a good target for an RPG or something, right? So we're like, okay, we're gonna delay. And his leave came up. So they're just like, okay, who who wants to do PCAM? And he asked me, uh, he was like, Hey Dirty P, you do you know how to use PCAM? I was like, I'm sure I can figure it out. I'm like, I've been a machine gunner before, you know? So then we went to the range, he gave me the rundown of the PCAM, you know. Did, did, did the drills for it and everything. I was like, all right, yeah, I can figure this out pretty easy. And then, uh, so then he, he asked the leadership if they mind if I swap out with them. They're like, yeah, came up, talked to me. They're like, you good to do it? I'm like, sure. And then uh, I ended up being the PKM guy. So then that just kind of became like my thing because uh, you know, not a lot of people want to do PKM. So we started training up for, for shovel op. Um, why, why was it called shovel op? We keep saying shovel op, but... Honestly, I have no idea. I, so I actually have two questions about labels here in a sure. second. So so first of all, it's the shovel op, and you just said you don't have any idea. I, I think that when we were doing like the, the video recce, I think there was like a shovel in the fucking trench. And so you just like, called it shovel op. Yeah, I mean, that's my guess. Uh, yep. <laughs> okay this, so the second label question i have is you've referenced and i have referenced the the name dirty p yeah and it sounds uh super kinky first right. of all so it has can, very little to do with my genitals yeah. well that's unfortunate right but i mean i mean you, it's not really unfortunate because my genitals are clean oh uh, well mm. i don't mm. I, as far as i know your name yeah. is dirty p so i'd like so, for you to explain that so that uh, i can when i was in the canadian military i served with the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry. And people call us the Dirty Patricias. Uh, so when I went to Ukraine, they're like, what's your call sign? I don't know, Wayne? Like, no, <laughs> choose a call sign. And I was like, I don't know. I don't, I don't, like, you know, people are like, oh, Thunder Wolf or you know, some stupid, like, or Northern, Northern Wolf. Vi Viking you know, tactician. Something stupid, just, like, a, you know, like a gamer tag. It's like, we yeah. grow up. And I was like, I don't know. I was like, and they're like, well, either you choose one or we're going to choose one and you ain't going to like something we choose. And I was just like, fuck. So like, all right, dirty Patricia. I'm like, all right, all right, and then that that was just too long. And they're like, all right, so cut it down to dirty P. And they're like, yeah, we like it because you know. I feel like that's still P. kind of unfortunate that that ended up be being. Could, I, I don't mind because it goes back to my military roots, and I'm I'm proud to be representing the Patricias. Yeah, you know, I'm proud to be representing Chosen. I'm proud to be rep representing the Patricias. Like, I really truly hope I'm not going to. I haven't said, and I won't say anything that upsets anyone. From chosen company or gets me in trouble or anything. it's it seems to me that you're kind of you're, you're speaking from the heart you know in a, in a lot I of want, instances you're speaking from the things yeah. that you saw my yeah. goal my goal is to give a proper representation for chosen business and you know ideally at some like maybe maybe some guys will want to or you know some guys some gals whatever 
maybe maybe they'll want to want to support us either you know they, they want to donate to some of the ngos that help us out or you know guys that are listening to this that are thinking about going to ukraine guys that are, that are switched on that want would you go to a would you community. turn people away that want to go to ukraine that might be from foreign nations would you we would, have guys from all over the world well like we, I, and i don't mean i don't mean turn turn people away but if if they meet our criteria like if they meet our criteria you know, like our, our leadership will look at them. And then if they, if they meet the criteria, then they're like, okay, yeah, come train. And then they come and train with us. And during the training period, if they, if they work out, mm -hmm. then they'll probably end up on our op. If they don't, we'll be like, hey, you know, thanks for coming out. But maybe our unit isn't best suited for you. Maybe you should go to the Legion and go train there. Go do what the Legion does until you make a connection and find a unit that's better suits you. Like have we, you we have no issue with people that want to go and that want to go and serve in Ukraine. We, but with us, we're looking for a certain breed right have you turned people away before yes like we've had people show up to chosen and they just end up being colossal fuckwads uh what like, i didn't we've, hear you we've had, we've had people show up to chosen they just end up being disasters okay you know we've had guys show up and they completely lie about everything interesting and it, it turns out real quick you know take them to the range and you know the guy's like yeah i'm a sniper go to the range the guy can't hit can't hit metal can't shoot yeah. yeah like just winging rounds like I, I mean we had one guy i sat there he went through t his full 10 mag loadout and then three of my mags to zero his rifle he had no idea how to zero his rifle and like mm -hmm. we're all looking at this dude and we're just like man yeah. so yeah he got kicked out of the unit oh, another guy he showed up just a colossal shit show and uh now he runs around making like you know TikToks and just trying to shit talk the unit for clout because you know then he could be like you know they're trying to kill me like man we don't even care about you like, mm. you're just some weirdo like fuck off you're just trying to use our name just for your own personal attention like kind of main character syndrome if you will yeah like he's he was in other units and and he uh, i mean uh he somehow slipped in into our unit you know but he was in like in all the units and, and he used different names. And I think that's probably how he, he like went under the radar. And uh and yeah, he's like known as like the most hated foreigner in Ukraine. And it's because he's literally like he is just a trash human. You know, one of those frauds like we were talking about. But he tries like go joining like hard units because then he could say, like, yeah, I was there, you know, but he doesn't want to go on ops because he's a coward. So he wants us to go do the work while he just sits there and gets Is that attention. common? That happens. Like there's, there's, there's guys that, uh, fight to go on ops, right? There's guys that, there's guys that are experienced and they generally go on a lot of ops because they're needed, you know, leadership types or just, you know, if you're a PKM, there's not many guys that want to carry the PKM, you know, you, you're not exactly the most kinetic. You kind of, I mean, you're, you're a support weapon, right? So you're saying you're not going to be front in the stack because it, I mean, if you are, that's a bad day. <laughs> yeah. You're setting a base exactly like right. you have a purpose and so other guys will kind of want a different role right so being a pcam or something like that you end up going on a lot more ops just because of your position your role so there are fewer so you end up getting yeah. tagged hey we need a pcam and there's only two and the other guy just let just you know got back or, or whatever or both or, ends up on it because usually like, yeah. if we have two sections going out one of each section so it's like your pcam well you're probably going you know is it, it's just one of the things, but then, so then you have guys that go regularly because they're skilled and they're trusted and, and you need them. So then you have a few spots that are up for grabs mm -hmm. and you'll have some guys that'll fight for it. You know, like you'll have guys be like, yo man, like I'll give you five, five non-stops if you don't go, you know, like any and guys, guys will sit there and they, they want those spots and you'll see them. They'll push for those spots. Guys will be pissed if they can't get that spot, you know? And then there's other guys who'll be like, well, you know, I don't, I don't mind. And it's like, all right, you know, like they'll go a couple months without going on an op or, or whatever. And then they'll be like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go on an op. And it's like, all right, you know, it's, you know, I'm not saying that's, that's a bad thing. I mean, everybody has a purpose. Everybody has a use. It's just some guys really want to get out there, you know, and some guys, some guys are fine with, you know, going at their own pace. And when we have a larger op where everybody goes, they go, mm -hmm. you know, nobody seems to, nobody seems to fight to not be on an op. You know, I've yet to see someone be like, like absolutely. Well, I mean, other than that, you know, one dude uh, where they, they, they just straight up fight to not go on an op. Like if they're like, Hey man, you want to go on an op? They're asked, they'll be like, yeah, I'll go. 
So like we, we, we generally in Chosen, because we, we have our recruiting standards, we generally do get like solid group of guys. Every now and then, as with, but that's with every unit. I mean, yeah, there's you, always a unit shit bag. Right? There's always someone that manages to slip in, you know? Yeah. You can only filter. Do out you guys so have much. a unit ship bag now? You don't have to name them. I mean, you can if you want to. Like I said, this is neutral ground. But do you have one now? Well, there's always one. There's always one. There's always one. Okay. So, I mean, that's just how it is. I mean, uh, if you, that, that you know that shouldn't be. People shouldn't take that as something specific to chosen. They should just no. understand that chosen is not. Just, I mean, every, you know, free of the same. It's, kinda, it's the same thing with, with with anything. You know, every every week it could be a different person. Like whoever fucks up that week. Yeah, you know, I mean, shit, me doing this might make me the unit shit bag. I don't know. We'll find out at the end, I guess. So let's go. Let's let's talk a little bit about shovel, about shovel op, and yeah. um, you know, uh, we, I don't think we need to go too in depth. Yeah, because we we, we just do a we, brief over that because we just did the, we just did the yes. the companion footage, and once again, and I'm gonna look at the camera here. You guys should go and absolutely check out that breakdown because he's there. It's using some of his footage, and you should absolutely. Um, you know, want to see that additional context yeah. from somebody that's on the ground. And but what was just to just to kind of drive us through that? What was the purpose of shovel op? So shovel op was uh, it was, you know, it was a good op to like for us to get back into the zone to you know pretty much tell Russia, hey, you know, because after Purple Two, they were like, yeah, we we wiped out Chosen. Well, yeah, yeah you, you, we're not you, dead. You had just gone quite a few rounds with Russia in Purple Two. Yeah, you needed you needed something to to. Show them we're still there. We're still fighting. We're not done. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to make sure that it was a good objective. Mm -hmm. And so then that was our objective. We got given that and we're like, all right, let's fucking do it. And we were told like Ukrainian units have tried and they've been pushed back. Uh, and uh, I mean, the Ukrainian lines from the closest Ru Russian line, I think it was like 50 meters, mm -hmm. you know, not far, you know, so like. That's like, that's like World War One stuff. Yeah. Well, know? I mean, in the video, you'll see like the, the, the. Russian trench, the one then it goes dead man's land, then the trenches we took, it's a T. Yeah. Right? So that T, right in front of that T is like down the end, there's a Ukrainian position. And it's like, they're just, I mean, they see each other, they can stare at each other. And, uh, and so just to, just to kind of set, for those that haven't seen or, or don't intend to go and watch the companion footage, do it. They've all, they have almost undoubtedly seen one of it. The many kind of viral subcut sections of yeah. that. There's the there's the guy running into your trench line yeah, with Z. a Z on yeah. his chest, and then he you know does the oh shit face, turns around and runs back out. There's yeah. you getting uh, blown up by what everybody assumed was an FPV drone, but yeah. we kind of correct that because yeah, that actually happened uh, well after the the assault. I ended up getting yeah. smashed with an artillery round, and you asked very politely, "Can I please?" Can I change positions, please? And as yeah. a as a Canadian man, that's the most stereotypical well, thing. Manners that you maketh could. the man. Manners maketh man. Yeah. Um, so uh, almost undoubtedly, people have seen, especially if they watch and follow combat footage, um, portions of that. But yeah. there is a there's so this, an entire. This will be the full the full footage with uh, me explaining what's going on, why it's happening. Yeah, because there's, I mean, even on Reddit, I, I was uh, myself and Mossy. We were replying to people on Reddit. Mossy being the the man that was shot in the neck. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, both of us are still alive, and we were replying, engaging people. And so, while I was doing my breakdown, I also answered some of the common questions that were posed uh, on uh, on Reddit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so you guys actually did like an almost an AMA kind of deal, which I think is yeah, that's something that that isn't really that hasn't historically really been available to people, and I think it's. It's a really interesting evolution of people's connection to modern war, right? Yeah. So, so video is just the first part of that. You, you know, video itself being well, an, the benefit in, of video is I can sit here and tell you guys, you know, we flew in on a dragon, but if I don't have a video, are you gonna believe it? Right, right. But now, if I got a video of us flying in on a dragon, you're like, holy shit, these guys got actually. Got well, a where dragon. I was, where I was actually taking that is, you know, we uh, uh, given just the nature of what we do, just, yeah. we do nothing but watch video. But even still, video itself, and I've said this before, is an imperfect lens because you still only get two of the senses. You get sight and sound, yeah. and under a lot of circumstances, you don't get sound because there's like music dubbed over it. One of the things that we got with the 15 or 20 something minute version of the shovel op that we're talking about is clear audio, extremely clear HD video. But then you guys added to the context by doing an AMA, by opening yourselves up yeah. to questions, 
presumably not long, in a relative sense, not long after this, you know, extremely kinetic operation where you know, Joe Smith from somewhere can just levy a question against somebody that had just conducted trench warfare in 2023. And that's not something that has ever been historically available. And I think the outcomes of that culturally are really interesting the further you go down that. That's not really our purpose here, think, but... And I think it also helps, I mean, it helps for, for getting fundraising, it helps with getting donations. Again, like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm kind of throwing that pitch out there, but it also helps for recruiting. Because when people want to, you know, if they're kind of thinking if they want to come to Chosen, it's like, well, here's a video. Mm -hmm. Do you think you could do this? Yeah. Do you honestly like, like actually self-reflect, be like, do you think you could do this? Do you think you can get, you can run over an AT mine and they crawl out of the vehicle and still jump in an occupied Russian trench. Yeah, you guys didn't stop when you, when you think hit the AT mine. No, that those, was... those and you can see it in the video. The guys get out and they they crawl into the trench while while Bravo team is assaulting the trench. They go and they push in with Bravo team. While us and Alpha, we're still pushing into our trench. Yeah. You know, and it's like, do you think you can you can get injured and still and still maintain composure? Do you think you can you can get injured and still, you know? what's in, in lack of better term like stay away from the light you know you don't give up even though you're hurt like mm. i mean uh, mossy when he got hit he kept saying like i'm gonna die i'm gonna die i'm dying and we we're just like man you're not dying he's like yeah i know i'm dying i'm like man you're not dying yeah. like stop get that out of your head you're gonna be fine we're gonna get you out of here you're gonna be fine you know and it, 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 i'm not saying mossy like died or anything or, or that he's weak he's just I mean, he was shot through the neck. So in his mind, yeah, you know, that's that's kind of a shitty way to get shot. But it's like he, it's like, man, you're you're okay, you know, like you're still you're you're still cognizant, you're aware, you know. Yeah. We the uh, our, our medic stopped the bleed and bandaged him up right quick, and it's like you're you're gonna be fine. You and he pulled through, and he you know he once they got up a little bit later, and I mean he was he was grumpy. He I mean you don't see it in the video, but he just sat there yelling at me for random stuff. Cause he was just laying there and myself and my ag were on one side of him making sure he was good while while making sure russians couldn't get to him and you know he'd always just constantly bet you like you looking at the sky like yeah i'm looking at the sky mm -hmm. hey can, can you really see with your shades on i'm like yeah i can see with my shades on he's like you sure and i'm like i'm pretty sure <laughs> like I'm, I'm looking at stuff <laughs> you know and then you know like i, I remember uh, i got hit with a suicide drone i uh, smashed the, the the berm right behind me and i was like man i'm gonna change position i moved over I, oh, you didn't. Feet. You didn't ask to change positions that time. No, just I just. I, to... I mean, I was like, I was like, all right, I'm just gonna move over two feet, two feet. And he was like, why'd you move? I was like, uh, because I don't feel like getting smashed. And he's like, get back to your spot. And I was like, oh, fuck me, so <laughs> I go back to my spot. And look how that worked out. Thanks, Mossy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, it was. But it, you know, he was aware, and it was like, came in like, you're gonna be, you're gonna be good. You're gonna be good. You know, he yeah. wasn't coming in and out. Uh, you know, love Mossy. I think he's an amazing guy. And he survived. He survived getting. Yeah. I, and I, he's, I don't he survived think, and, and he recovered and he's back fighting. And he's so he's in Ukraine still to this day yeah. fighting after oh, being yeah. shot through the neck. Yeah, guy doesn't stop. He's a warrior. Wow. That's that's the kind of guys we have in Chosen Okay, you know, like personal beef aside from from everybody, like we still, you know, we'll we'll still go push. Mm -hmm. You know, we it, we have some amazing dudes. There's some dudes with some amazing stories. Like it's yeah. It's, I mean, I wish I could, I, I could tell them, I, I just don't want to take other people's thunder and make it seem like their stories are about me or, or to try and get attention for them. Like, I, I hope they find an outlet or, or, or they get the chance to tell their stories because they're some amazing dudes. So that takes us to 109 in Samara. Is it yeah, Samara so there or was, Samara? There was a couple ops between, but yeah, well, uh, uh, next, next ones pretty much for us would be 10, 109 in Samara. This one, this one, this is where we're about to get into something that isn't publicly known yeah. about the yeah. loss of a chosen company soldier that was an American veteran. Yeah. Um, that has been known was killed during this operation, but there's an element of his loss that this is the first time chosen is really talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, uh, and you were also injured on this. Yes. This was, the, so this would be the opera. I got injured for the second time. Uh, and this is something that's a very uh, sensitive subject for, uh, I mean, not only myself, but for, I think, like 
all have chosen. Uh, it's 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 a really hard thing to think about. I mean, it's it's. Well, let's let's just start yeah. with it kind of chronologically. What was yeah. what was the date time group? Generally speaking, oh. what was the purpose of the operation? So, uh, we went out to go take uh, two Russian trenches. Okay, right. Uh, obviously, Russians in them. Uh, it was it was a larger op. I think there was like twenty six attacks assaults going on at once. Purpose of that obviously being to disperse Russian resources. They can't really attack all of them, can they? I mean, man to man, yes, but you know, mortars, artillery, drones. I mean, they got to pick and choose, right? And uh, so all attacks went off at once, and our guys went and did their did their assault, and they, uh, it was a a nighttime assault, evening nighttime, I should say. Uh, because we we fight way better than the Russians at night, so the guys were able to take uh, the first trench and uh, and then uh, push it into Samaria. So first trench would have been one hundred and nine, and that's a position number. That's in it. Yeah. So one hundred and nine is a position. Yeah. So okay. uh, it was a it was a long shallow trench, and uh, and uh, they were able to take that and. Russians were just hitting it with AGS, and they took a. We we had some uh, some casualties from that. Not not critical, but you know, guys took shrapnel. Some wounded. Yeah, and so they uh, they took themselves off the battlefield, which is probably a good idea because I mean, if you can't move as fast, that just makes you an easier target, right? Um, almost a liability. Yeah. So it was a good it was a good call for those guys, and uh, and then uh, the dudes pushed to Samara. And they went and salted Samara, and, and uh, you know, I hate I hate praising uh, Russians, but there's one Russian there that uh, the boy said he was on his own, and he had a PKM and, a, and like a box of grenades, and he pushed back like three assaults on his own, and they just kept smashing him. And uh, is that is that abnormal to see? Yeah, yeah, very abnormal. Like there's some Russians that'll try and put up a fight, but it's like not like this guy. And I I uh, I was told, so I, I mean, I was in a different position. I was uh I was further back. I was I was actually in in and uh, shovel, and uh, I had a, had a different role at the time. And so these guys did. Uh, oh no! At this time, I was pushed up uh, to 107, which is a trench like 150 meters uh, northeast or so, north northeast from 109. So I I moved up, and I was just kind of I was listening to radio and everything. And uh, one of our guys spoke speaks Russian, and so he was telling the guy, "Surrender, surrender, we'll let you live." And his response was something like, like, fuck you, I'm not surrendering. And he just started like bursting off like PKM. They're just like, fuck, we gotta kill this guy. And uh, eventually they hit, they, they, they caught him with, uh, the guy popped out of the trench. Uh, I might be getting this wrong, so hopefully the guys don't hate me for, for mixing this up. But he, it's, uh, I think he popped out of the trench and the guy's like threw a nonstop. What a nonstop is, it's like a, an energy drink can that we fill up with you know, explosive and put an F1 grenade uh, fuse on it. And it makes a big boom. We usually use them for bunkers. And uh, one of the guys just chucked that, and the Russian tend to like ran over it, and it just kind of fucking split him. And when uh, you say split him, yeah, like a like a wishbone. So I'm told. So like quite act, quite literally split. Yeah, because he had like one leg on each side man. and just like fucking mangled him, and that ended that gunfight. And then so then that trench was ours. And uh, I mean, I mean to be getting some details wrong. I'm just kind of brushing over it because I wasn't in those trenches. So this is just secondhand information, right? But you shared that, so he had previously pushed back three assaults on that yeah, position. So that was, that was this a, Russian had. Yeah, that was, and uh, I know that there's other Russians in the trench, but there there's guys that were, uh, they were killed, and there's guys that were, like, smashed into a bunker, and they, they, they're just, you know, slowly dying because they're mm -hmm. being crushed. And it just, I mean, that's war, right? Don't want to die, don't invade a country. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, so then, uh, at this point, uh, I get pushed up and I get told I'm to link up with another guy. And that was Gimli. And that, uh, well, it turned out to be Gimli. And uh, I'm, we were to take six Ukrainians into a tree line to go dig in. So let's, let's pause here for a second. Sure, sure. Because Gimli, yeah. and correct any of my information that I have, Gimli is Dalton Medlin. Yeah. He was a U.S. Army veteran from 2017 to 2021, um, achieved the rank of E4 got out in 2021, and then presumably kind of immediately went to Ukraine sometime afterwards because you said that he'd been there for about a year. Yeah, yeah. He was a – honestly, like, 
he would I was described and he he was like the embodiment of what chosen should be you know everything like everything from like like the guy was a hard charger I mean he was Gimli he was you know not exactly the largest stature man right he was a he was a shorter dude big beard he's actually the reason why I grow mine uh try and grow mine even longer uh and it's kindest guy fierce fierce fearless like just amazing dude if we had a, if we had you know a hundred Gimli's that'd be amazing like chosen would be unstoppable and uh so you got linked up with Gimli to yeah. take these six Ukrainians to do what uh so they were to go into this tree line that we were told was was empty and we were told uh there was just mines in there and uh we we're like okay well that sucks but I mean everything's a freaking minefield over there so is what it is and we we're told we we're gonna go dig in these six uh these six Ukrainians so Gimli and I were to go and lead them in make sure the area was clear of mines and then uh we had placed the six Ukrainians and they would dig in and we were to do security while they're digging once they're done digging you know we pull back they obviously provide their own security and then that would have been that was just like a, a you know an extra objective and uh so we end up crossing we end up grabbing these guys and uh we cross this this one minefield to get to this cleared path that the russians were using to get to trench 109 in samara and so obviously there was no mines on it if the russians are walking it. you know like you could see the path and the grass is well worn oh huh? just speak up a little bit oh sorry oh yeah so there was a well-worn path so we knew there was no mines on said path because the russians were obviously using it to to reinforce their own trench you know yeah. so we had to make our way to that to that trail line and we're walking down the trees and uh we end up getting to this one point where we get told like okay you guys can push into the tree line this is where we want you guys to dig in and this is night it's all nighttime this is uh three in the like two or three in the morning okay so uh we're you, we're out in the tree line like we can't are you guys operating under night vision or no, only uh gimli had uh he had a thermal a thermal uh thermal it's like a mono yeah okay and he he, he had offered me a uh uh a, a night vision like handheld and i was like i was like man i gotta pcam I, I can't shoot this with one hand like i need yeah. i need both hands on the gun if i gotta shoot i was like uh i was like thanks i was like but i'll just i'll like I'll, if you see anything let me know i was like i'll take i'll take a lead as we're walking up and then you know when we're walking into the minefield because with the thermal you can see the difference between ground and mines mm -hmm. so he walked us through and i followed him the metal kind of holds heat yeah in a yeah. different way of course so, you, so, so it'll stand out yeah right? so he, when we were walking through the minefield he's just staring at the ground with it and every when he lifted his foot he would look back make sure i put my foot there yeah and then i would do the same with the ukrainians we made our way across that took a few minutes and then walking on the trail i took lead because i had the pcam and then when we get to the spot he's like uh i, I remember it took a knee and i was like i was like i was like how's this and he's like they're saying keep going he passed me and he's like all right now they say good so i went up to him and i posted down and i remember looking at him, i was like hey gimli i was like i'm gonna stay on the trail and point and be on my p-camp down the trail and i remember he's like what what do you mean why and i was like because if they're coming this is how they're going to come is down this trail i was like this is ideal for a pcam is on this trail because it's you know that's machine gun theory mm -hmm. they're going to come running in a straight line like down this trail because it's minefield in the grass i was like let them i'm like they're just gonna run into my to my machine gun i was like i can move into the tree line but like now i got to deal with the trees to try and get clear shots i'm like right here this is perfect if this is their only way because as far as we were told this is their only way to get here so then uh, uh i was like you lead them in you can check for the mines you lead them in they come to me we make sure that they do the same thing i'm going to stay here on this trail and, and and fire down the trail line if they if the russians come and this this whole thing like i'm like this this eats at me every fucking day every day every like i can't i there's not a day that goes by where i don't think about this there's not a night where i where i that goes by where, where i don't dream about this i mean even now like i get maybe two or three hours of sleep at a time because this it just haunts me so <laughs> Gimli was like, okay, f okay, like, knew he had to do it, you know, turns around and he's got his thermal and he's on the radio giving a sit rep, you know, we got two drones above us and uh, so he's got his one hand on the radio, the other hand he's holding up the, he's got the monocle and uh, he's looking and he's walking it and I remember because we're, we had some moonlight, right, so we're out in the open. 
you know, the grass is maybe four or five inches. How's your visibility? We could, you could see like into the, like the tree line, the edge of the tree line, but you can't see in the tree line. Right. Right. Mind you, if you're in the tree line, you're in the dark and you could see us because we're in the light. So <clears throat> Gimli's leading and there's two Ukrainians behind him. The next Ukrainian's coming up to me. And all I hear from Gimli is contact front. And then the trees just explode. How far, <sighs> how far away is the tree line from your position where you are? Five, seven meters, maybe. Close. Yeah. Okay. So and, Gimli calls contact front. Yeah. And then just erupted, just gunfire. And I see Gimli and the two Ukrainians just dead weight drop. Okay. So I drop behind my PCAM and I just start lighting up everything from the left of Gimli on like a 45 degree angle. Just, I, I, I thought, thought I'd seen a couple flashes, muzzle flashes. You're just spraying the tree so I at just, this point. Yeah, I just leveled my PKM. So it would have been sitting like, what, five inches off the ground, put it level and I'm just aiming and just kind of, because I'm like, if anybody's trying to move, anybody's head's in there, everybody's going to try and run, I'm cutting them the fuck down. And I seen a couple flashes. I swore I, I swore I seen a couple flashes and I just start dumping rounds into it. So overwhelming suppression of fire, right? Win the firefight. Turn around, go squat, tell the guys, stop, stop, stop. These are Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. I don't speak Ukrainian. They don't speak English. So they're only doing anything if I am physically am doing something. And they're terrified. And I'm just like, it's all quiet. I'm like, fuck, I don't have a radio. Give me the radio. So I'm like, my only contact like is to start telling people over over at 109 in Samara what's going on. So I start shouting, telling them what's going on. I'm like, these guys obviously know we're here because they just fucking let us up. And I'm trying to get, get a hold of Gimli and I'm like, what the fuck's going on? And uh, So you're trying to communicate with Gimli? Yeah, I'm trying to see if Gimli's alive because I just watch him drop. And just like, you know, like someone's hit and they fall to the side. Mm. No, he just drop, down, just straight down. Just crump kind of crumbles yeah. straight down just drops straight down and uh and the, like the two ukrainians behind him fell and they like went to the fetal right and i could see them and i could see like especially the one that was that was closer to me i could see him still moving i was like fuck i was like okay so i tell the second guy like the, the the close the ukrainian to my right i was like grab him pull him and they did to, to, i told him to grab the closest ukrainian pull him i was like because if we can at least get this guy pulled back to our to our area we got to go. We can grab this guy. Plus, it gets him the fuck out of my way so I can put my PKM that way. And so when I'm telling him, like, hey, grab him and just pull him back, you know, the guy's reluctant. But he, he I, I think he, I don't know what he thought I was trying to tell him to do, but once he realized, like, I was like, grab him and pull him, he, he for, for some reason, he crawls up a little bit, gets next to the guy and grabs him. And when he does that, the tree line opens up again. He gets hit. Fuck me. So, so at this point, you have Gimli that is clearly hit in some way. You have yeah. two, the two Ukrainians, and, and then an third. additional Ukrainian. And then the two Ukra the, the other Ukrainians were hit because uh, they just sprayed open. So I, I think out of everybody that was there, I was the only one that didn't get shot. Mm. And that literally just comes down to where I was placed in relation to where the, where the Russians were. So uh, where we got placed in was where there was a where, where there was a russian position now at this time we have no idea what's going on i have no idea what's in the tree line how many guys are in the tree line what we're looking at nothing i can't communicate with these guys so i can't do a counter ambush being like okay we're gonna we're gonna fire we're all gonna get up and we're gonna push in because i can't talk to them you know language barrier mostly or? and like these guys don't know what the fuck's going on they're, 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 they're just carrying shovels and sandbags a minute ago and now they're getting lit up and the, like, I just look at them, they just put up the rifles and they're looking at me and they're just, and they're shooting. And I'm just like, what? I'm like, fuck, man. Thought process goes through my head. All right, do I tell these guys to start throwing grenades? But I'm like, if they start throwing grenades, they can hit, they can hit Gimli. I can't start throwing grenades. How far from your position is Gimli at this point? Like five meters. Okay. He's, he's literally just like made it to the edge of the tree line and then drop, drop right there. So I can't see anything in front of them. I can't see into the tree line. It's all dark. No idea what's going on in there. And then I'm trying to tell the guys at 109, Gimli's hit, we're all hit. Like, we need help. You know, 
and I was like, we need help. Uh, and when I'm doing that, then the tree line opens up again, right? So this is the, the second, third, second or third time that it, it opens up, you know, all hell, no, second time, I think. And then all hell breaks loose again. And then we go, we go quiet. I'm just like, okay, fuck. Like, it's only a matter of time. I mean, mind you, all this is happening within one minute, right? So me telling the story is a lot longer than- I'm betting, it, I'm betting it feels like an eternity though. Oh man, Dude, there's a longest, the longest three seconds of my life happened. So when we're there, um, we light up again and then we stop and I'm just like, man, I'm feeling my belt. My belt is, is pretty low in my, in my bag. Ammo. Yeah, for my PKM. And I'm like, if I, the moment I try and reload, they're gonna hear that. I'm like, we're fucked. Like you can't just like yeah because you're only f you're five meters from yeah. a, a Russian position and I'm just like man like this like this is bad I'm looking at the at the at the Yuki's and they're just staring at me and I'm just like shit and I'm calling for Gimli I'm like Gimli make a noise something to tell me your life like Gimli Gimli and I'm calling for Gimli and I'm loud you know everybody can hear me I, I I'm told like even Ryan Ryan's like a kilometer away from me he could hear me you know everything I was doing I was just shouting I was like they know we're here they know we're we're foreigners you know they've been hearing us all fucking night talking. So I'm just calling out for him. I'm like, give me a noise, man. Give me something. Nothing. And me calling out for Gimli, I pretty much gave my position away. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I hear it and I feel it. It's just a thump. Just poof. What do you mean by a thump? Something at the ground. Oh, a th like a thud. Like a, yeah. like a, like a, you hear and, and feel a thud next to you. Yeah. And I just, I, I remember just looking and this is the longest longest because you know what's up your brain's just going your brain's just firing and you know what it is and i'm looking and I, I get the chance to turn my head a little bit and i can see the yuki to my right and he's about four feet away and he's just looking at me he's just terrified i was like yep yeah. it was a grenade yeah and you know what it is and it's just like okay like i remember thinking like do i just try and jump on it do i do i try and roll away like i'm already prone i can't get more prone what do i do I was just like, well, this is going to hurt. And then wham, felt it. Went off, just blew me right onto my fucking side. Right, I rolled I rolled onto my left side and I just showed out, I'm hit, I'm hit. How far away would you say the grenade was? A foot maybe. So A foot? Yeah. Yeah. Sucked. <laughs> Don't recommend doing that. That's why I say I'm a, I'm a terrible at hot potato. So uh, I know I took shrapnel from that. And the only thing I felt from that was the piece that went through the side of my chest and it went into my like it went in like between the ribs and it uh and it went and it pierced my chest my chest cavity and i could feel all the hot air coming in and you're so like you're self-assessing this like this is all happening in a fraction of a second right like all these thought processes just happen in like fractions of a second and and i could feel my lung burning my right lung was burning and i was like fuck i was like i'm dying you know, and it wasn't like, fuck, I'm dying. Oh, no, poor me. I was like, I, I didn't give a shit if I died. You know, and that's not trying to be being like, I'm all tough or anything. I was just like, no, like my friend's there. I'm like, but one of, one of two things is happening. I'm like, I'm like if, if I'm bleeding into my lung, because like, I knew there was a hole in my lung because I could feel the hot air that came in from the blast. And so it cooked, it, was, it felt like it was cooking my fucking lung. I was like, if I'm bleeding into my chest cavity, that means I'm going to asphyxiate because my lung's not going to be able to open. If I'm bleeding into my lung, that means I'm going to drown. So I was like, I have a very finite amount of time left. There's a very, very, like I have very limited time to make a decision what to do. And, uh, and I'm like, I got these Yuki's around me and they're all looking at me. They're screaming, they're crying. They're are, they, are they looking for, are, are they in horror or? Are oh they, yeah, they're terrified. But you know, are like they also looking at you for them, what there's to do There's three of them that are just, or? there's three of them that are, I mean, all of us are wounded. All of us are either shot or, yeah. or hit with, with shrapnel or both. And, and they're looking for me to do something. They don't know what to do. These guys, these guys. I so mean, they're looking at you for what to do next. Like these guys probably only had a couple of weeks of training and you know, they're looking at, they're, they're looking, I'm just like, man, like I'm fucked. And I'm like, if I die here, these Ukrainians aren't going to go anywhere. They're not going to, they're not going to know what to do. And they're going to die next to me. And I'm like, like, I can't, I can't be having that. And I, I, I'm like, I can't, it, it eats at me every fucking day, every fucking day. So I was like, if we stay here, it's only a matter of time before that AGS that was hitting, uh, that was hitting 109 in Samaria is going to be turned on us. 
Russians will bomb their own position. They don't give a shit. When we were in, in shovel op, uh, doing that shovel trench, the Russians were in the trench and the, the Russians started hitting with artillery. They don't give a fuck. You know, if they if they kill like three or four of their own guys, they'll they don't give a shit if they kill like if, if it has them killing six of us, whatever. They don't. Care. I mean, obviously with them with their meat wave attacks, they don't give a shit. So it's only a matter of time before before IDF starts coming down on us. We have no idea what we're looking at in the tree line. We have no idea how many guys are there. No idea what that position looks like. Obviously, they know we're there. Obviously, we're suppressed. If we stand up, we get hit. We move, we get hit. We do anything, we get hit. We're fucked. So then I made the decision, we got to get the fuck out of here. You know, take anybody who can move, get the fuck out of here. So I stand up and I grab the guy next to me. I just tug him like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And we're fucking bolt down the trail and these guys, all of them get up. And to this point, you had yet to hear from Gimli. Not a word. But you nothing. had, you had, not you even, had been not calling even, for him. Not, not a groan, nothing. And I mean, in hindsight, like he, I mean, there's so much in hindsight. Like, oh my God, this is the shit that literally eats me every fucking day. Like he could have just been, he could, he could have been conscious and not making, not, not moving because he was right there and there was a Russian, you know, one or two feet away from him. Or he could have been unconscious and not, not capable of it. I, I was like 90% sure he was dead. And I was like, we can't all die in that location. Like if I died, like I already had a hole in my chest. And if I died there, those, these Yuki's were 100% going to die. Yeah, you got six other, well. I had six lives that were looking at me. And so I bolted. So even the two that were hit with Gimli, they were still up? They were still? Alive, yeah. Alive. Okay. So I bolt down the trail with these Yuki's. And they come running behind me. And I stop. I stopped about, I don't know, maybe 100, 150 meters. Because I'm looking over at 109. And I could see two of our guys that were at 109. Mm -hmm. This is where we, we had to sit there with. The, uh, where we took our time getting through because it's a minefield. And we're looking at him. I was like, I got to tell him about killing me. I was like, these guys, I was like, they could put a team together. They could get the guys from Samara. They could grab, uh, they could grab our QRF. They could go get Gimli. They can go fuck these guys in this fucking tree line. Fuck them. They could go, they could go get Gimli. I was like, I got to tell him. And I remember locking eyes with one of the guys and I still remember seeing his face. It was just all white. He's, a, he's got blonde hair, right? So just white. I just lock eyes on him. I just ran to him. And I remember... Just running. And I was just thinking, just don't think about stepping on the ground. You're floating. You're not stepping on the ground. You're just running. You're floating in the air. And every step. Sh -sh 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 -sh. Ran. Wait, are you running? Like, this? is this the minefield that you're crossing right now? Yeah, yeah. So, you, so, so you're hot-footing it across this minefield. Yeah. And just, I was just, I just knew I had to tell him about Gimli. And I get to the edge of the trench, and I just throw myself in the trench, and I start telling him about Gimli. And uh, one of the guys is a medic. He's actually the same medic that helped out Mossy. And uh, he starts immediately jumping on me, working on me. He's like, he's like, you got a hole in your chest. I was like, yeah, I know, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And they start pulling my ammo off me and, you know, taking my weight, right? And I, I'm telling him, so while he's checking me, I'm telling him, I was like, Gimli's there. I'm like, I think he's dead, but I, Gimli's there. I was like, they got Gimli, he, he didn't get out. And at the time I thought like, I thought at least one of those Yuki's was stuck with him. I was convinced that the Yuki directly behind him was also hit, was also like dead. Turns out he wasn't. All the Yuki's got out. Because mm -hmm. when I stopped, I didn't count them. I seen three of them go by. So I was looking right and I was, then I focused on Ollie and I was just, I was essentially like mentally telling myself, you're about to run through a minefield. I'm playing that up in my head how you're just floating. You know, can't step on a mine if you're not stepping on the ground, right? So then uh, I'm telling him, you guys got to go get him. I was like, I, I, don't, I was like, I'm, I'm probably going to, probably going to die, but you guys got to go get him. Somebody's got to go get him. And, uh, I guess they, they were they They wanted to mount up, uh, some dudes to go get him, but they were low on ammo. They had no grenades cause they just took two trenches. They just, and they, they, they didn't have the ability to. And, uh, so then I had a evac and so I'll, I'll should I do that part? And then. You tell it yeah, how, how okay, you want we'll to tell. We'll do, we'll you tell it how you want to tell. We'll do it. We'll do it chronological. So, uh, so then, uh, I get told, uh, yeah, you're gonna be. We're gonna get you out of here. And uh, so the the guy, the other guy that was with the blonde hair guy, uh, that was taking my ammo off me. They're like, yeah, he's gonna lead you out. I was like, man. He's like, I gotta go get my kid. I was like, fuck. You know, solid dude. Both of them love him. I was like, I can't wait. I have a finite amount of time. I was like, if if my time runs out and I can't walk, that means people got to carry me. If people got to carry me, that's six dudes that could be out getting Kimley. I was like, 
let me go as far as I can go while so I So you're go. you're still mobile right now. Yeah. You you can move on your own power yeah. at least to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh and then so I start making my way back to uh, position 107. And uh, 107 was it was a, a trench that Ukrainian or Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian reconnaissance unit took. And uh we in there we had a medic. Mm -hmm. Right? So I go there. When I get there, the Yukis are there. And uh so I, I only seen like four or five of the Yukis because they're getting like other Ukrainians are helping them go further and f further back to the CCP. So one of our guys, Kaz, uh, uh, he, uh, he grabs me in once he's got a chance. I mean, I, I, I was wandering around on the trees and got a little lost and was getting really angry because uh, I couldn't find, find out where the hell I was going. And then uh, Kaz called me over and I made my way to him. And uh, so he starts doing an assessment on me. And he sees the hole in my chest and he's like, you got, your ass is peppered. He's like, you got holes in your leg. And he was like, he's like, I'm going to tourniquet. I was like, no, no. I was like, is it, is it pulse? Is it the blood pulsing? And he's like, no, I'm like, leave it. I was like, if you put a tourniquet on me, I'm not gonna be able to walk. I was like, let me walk as far as I can walk. I was like, let me do it. He's like, okay. And so like, like even while he was checking my chest, uh, I mean, the, the, we, we joke about it because uh, he slipped his, uh, his finger inside my chest hole. What, what? So he had like a, like a finger in the hole. Yeah. He fingered my chest. And it's, you showed me earlier, it's like here -ish, Yeah, right? Yeah, it's, it was uh, a couple inches wide. And, uh, and so like he, could, he, was, he was fingering my hole in my chest and he was, he was also like wiping the blood off my ass, uh, trying to see how many holes were in my ass, I guess. And at this, at this moment, like a uh, Ukrainian pope dude. So, so he's got his, just help me understand for a second. He's got his finger inside of you and he's rubbing your ass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very romantic moment. I was also very angry because he was fingering my chest. I'm sure. I'm sure you were. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I was. Uh, in not so kind words, telling him I'm going to punch him in the mouth. <laughs> and uh, and at this time, a Ukrainian poked his head in, and he just looks and sees the situation. He's just like ah, nadobra, and that means not good. <laughs> and he just like pulls his head out. And, yeah, and then not, uh, not good. Yeah, that's what the Ukrainian said when he when he looked yeah, at. Yeah, and he just popped out, and then. Uh, so Kaz did a quick patch job with uh, with chest seals on me. And yeah. he, he just slapped on chest seals because uh, at the time, I could hear I could hear one of the Ukrainians, uh, or I could hear one of our other guys that was working on Ukrainian, and he was like, uh, "This is an arterial bleed. It's arterial bleed. It's, it, there's a lot of blood. It's pulsating blood, and like, you know, that's bad." And that was one of the guys that was out there with me. So I was like, "Kaz, go help him. Like, I, I'm I'm gonna go. I'm gonna keep pushing back." So there's a, there's a reason he was. Yeah, he putting his finger inside of your so this, he, this wound, uh, though, right? I mean, it's it's checking the depth of the wound. It, yeah, so uh, I mean, I, I I'm not as medically linguistic or whatever the fuck you want to say, like he is. But uh, so he was putting his finger in because uh, he wanted to see if he could feel the hole going in my chest cavity, or if he could feel the shrapnel or whatever, you know. Because mm -hmm. uh, if it if it was just this massive hole in my chest, then yeah, bad. Because uh, he told me he was trying to figure out if he needed to do a. Uh, Needle decompression. Mm -hmm. A chest seal uh, or yeah. a seal over top of the hole with a decompression. And yeah. If And uh, hey, I mean, at the time I wasn't really thinking about that. I was just thinking my fucking chest hurts and my lungs on fire. And uh, and so then again, I was like, okay, let me go. Mm -hmm. Like, go, go work on these guys. Let me go. I'm going to move myself further back. You know, CCP. I'm going CCP. And uh, so I get out and uh, uh, this one Yuki kid muckles on me. So I'm just kind of like walking. I'm at this time, like, you know, I'm starting to get like lightheaded. I don't know if it was like just like the, the adrenaline wearing off or the shock of the situation. It or, could be the giant hole in your chest. Or maybe that, you know, that, that probably had a, had a bit of a factor. I'm just, I'm, I'm not feeling all too together at the time. And this, this Yuki kid grabs me and he starts walking with me. And he's helping me. He's trying to, you know, he's, he's, he's trying to like uh, get me moving along. He's leading me, which is nice because I had no fucking idea how to navigate this tree line. I tried doing it on the way out and I got lost and fell in this fucking wire and got all tangled up for like 20 minutes. Just, fuck, I was angry. But uh, so he leads me back and he leads me back to a shovel actually. And we get the shovel. And I remember being like, and he's like, we wait. Wait for what? He's like, not safe now. And it was because uh, uh, the Russians started hitting uh, 109 in Samara with IDF. And that's, I mean, that was only like 450 meters, 500 meters away. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, no, I'm not safe. And I'm just like, fuck, man. I'm like, I'm going. I was like, I don't give a shit. I know where I'm at. I can find my way back from here. So I just start crawling up. And one of the Yuki's grabs me and pulls me back in the trench. I'm just like, man, fuck off me. And I remember I tried punching. I was like, 
has probably like the most bitch punch ever. He was just like, you know, fucks me off. And I was just like, man, this isn't good. Cause you know, normally I'm a big dude. If I punch you, you're going to feel it. And I was just like, Rah! it was just, just like nothing. It's like, all right, fuck. Like, I, you know, I didn't hit him in the face. I just hit him for his chest. It's like, fuck. And then he, so he just fucked me off. I was like, all right, cool. You leave me alone. I climb back up and I start, and I start make my way down. And that same Yuki kid comes running out of the trench, grabs me and starts walking me. Mind you, we're walking a little bit faster, and, and you can hear like the the explosions from the IDF hitting the hitting the trenches that our guys just took, that our guys were still in, and uh, and uh, he's like, uh, Suka, Suka, every time they hit, and I'm just like, yeah, man, big Suka, big Suka, and we start walking a little bit faster, and he's like essentially dragging me at this point. We get to the CCP, and Ryan's there, and uh, Ryan and another one of the guys. Uh, they cut off my my gear and they cut off my shirt and they cut my pant leg, my right pant leg down. And uh, Ryan's just like Jesus starts pulling off the chest seals because by now they're all kind of fucking mangled up, right? And uh, he starts applying more chest seals and he sees a hole in my chest and that's when I knew things were serious because he's like, we got a medevac, dirty pee now. He's got to get out of here now. And I was just like, ah, oh, fuck, because Ryan Ryan's a hard hard motherfucker. If he's you know if he got a minor injury, he'll tell you to suck it the fuck up, you know. So when he's when he's saying it, we we need to move now, that means it's serious. That's 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 bad. You know, like I remember when I had a TBI, and I and like uh, from the the shovel op, I had a TBI, I ended up having a TBI and traumatic blast damage to my organs. My organs were swelling, and that was just from like not on the blast damage or the fucking shock waves or whatever from the, from the, all the explosions. Uh, that sucked ass, and I remember like trying to make my way out, and I was just like, I was like, man, this blows. I'm carrying the PKM and everything. I'm so heavy. I'm so fucking tired. And uh, Ryan's like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm sitting here. So why are you sitting there? I'm like, is everybody sitting? He's like, let's go get move, get moving. He's like, what are you carrying? I was like, PKM. He's like, I don't give a fuck. Get moving. I was like, man, fuck I do. <laughs> I was like, I was like, uh, like I'm, I'm kind of fuck, fucked up at the moment. Like, give me a minute, you know? But obviously I didn't say that because you probably would have punched me in the mouth or something. But I mean... I was just like, ah, oh, fuck balls. I was like, this sucks. But, you know, in hindsight, like, that's that's good leadership. You can move, move. Yeah. You know? And that's something I tell people. If you can move, move. You know, don't, don't, don't take someone else's, don't take more manpower to move you. If you can move yourself, just move. And if you can move, don't stop moving. Because the moment you stop moving, you're going to get tired and you're not going to want to get up again. Keep moving. As, as long as you can move, move. Don't waste resources if you don't have to. You know, those manpower, that manpower, if I would have taken six guys to carry me back because I didn't want to walk, that's six guys that couldn't, that, 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 that could have been used to go get Gimli, to help, help one of my brothers that, that, you know, eats me alive because, you know, like, I, it took me months, months to, to come to the fact that, that I made the right decision. You know, even now saying that doesn't when you feel say, right. When you say made the right decision, what do you mean by that? Because I, I made the snap to leave, and that left Gimli there alone. And under, based so on the when, information that you had, the information I had at the time, I uh, it was the right decision. Tactically, it was the right decision. Emotionally, it's a fucking terrible decision. It eats at you. That is that is a, that is a call. But it's it's one of those things where they tell you in leadership, sometimes you have to make that call. And, it, and it's, it's fuck because it, it eats at me because it's like, you know, so many, so many things nonstop just fucking devours me because it's, you know, I wasn't leadership, you know, that hits me, but it's like, okay, when I was in the Canadian Army, I was a sergeant, but I'm like, well, you know, like I shouldn't have had that, but it's like, what all is there? You know, it's this constant battle pulling on me. I should have gone into the tree line. I should have just fucking gone in and died with them. Well, then the Yukis would have died with you. It's like, what do I want to be? Do I, do, you know, do I want to be a hero? Do I want to fucking be a tough guy? Or do I want to be the guy that gets all, that gets all these Yukis killed? I, I, you know, they shouldn't have been out there in the tree line in the first place. So it's, it's, it's fucked. And so now, when we end? leave, when we leave the CCP, uh, walk down and we go wait for the, for the area where the, the vehicles can come and get us. You know, there's other guys, the other guy, the, the Yukis that were wounded, they're collecting at this one area. And I was just like, no, I'm like, I'm just going to keep going. I was like, I don't want to lay down. I was like, I'm afraid if I lay down, I'm just going to pass out. And I don't want to be, I don't want to pass out. I'm like, let's just keep walking. So we ended up walking. I, I think I walked a total of like 3.2 kilometers. And one of, at this time, instead of a Yuki walking with me, it was one of, it was the, one of the guys that was cutting off, uh, he helped bandage me up. <laughs> and we ended up walking all the way. 
And uh, so I get told uh, when I get pulled out of like military vehicles and we go and they put me in an in a ambulance, uh, our company medic was there. And I see a couple of our guys that were, weren't on the op. I was like, oh, fuck yeah, this is QRF. They're going. And uh, I get told. To get Gimli. Yes. And I get told uh, by our company medics, Gimli's alive. I was like, what do you mean he's alive? I was like, I've seen him. I was like, I don't think he's alive. And, and they were like, no, they, they had a thermal drone on. They are like, Gimli, Gimli's alive. His, his body's still warm. He wasn't moving. But they're like, he's still, he's still warm. I was like, what the fuck? That, that wrecked me. Because now that went from me leaving like one of our guys' bodies to now I left him behind. You know, I left a wounded comrade. I left a friend. Like, I can't sit there and say Gimli was my best friend and I knew him insanely well. But him and I had just started hanging out a couple of weeks prior. So like, I still have a lot of good memories of just hanging out with him. You know, I can't sit there and say we went years back. I'm not going to try and take that from anybody. But now I just got told he's alive. That how long? Twofold. How long is this point from um, when you... I don't know, this, that was, the sun was up, so... A few hours at a minimum. I don't, uh, maybe... Yeah. Well, I, I mean, if it was two like or my, three in the morning when, like you, my, when you started the operation. Like my memory, I mean, not my memory's fucked, but it's just like the, the time, was it the time dilation? It's just really weird. Certainly, yeah. Right? I know when we went out there, it was like three in the morning. Mm -hmm. When we got here, it was like three in the morning. It was September 27th, three in the morning. And uh, I know when I made it to the ambulance, the sun was coming up. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got told he was still alive. And that hit me twofold. One, because I just left a friend behind. And two, there's hope. He's still alive. The guys can get him. You know, man to man, our guys can fuck him up. So then, oh man, I'm getting that thing right in my mouth. No, it's great. I Dude. feel like I'm just getting yeah, closer and closer to it. Put your mouth over it. <laughs> so then, uh, you know, uh, that was the last I heard uh, until later that day. I, could, I, I go to the hospital. So this is kind of, I, I just... I want to pause for a second because it's been known. Actually, I, actually, now that I say like the sun, I th I, the sun probably wasn't up. I think it was just the headlights of the vehicle. Okay. Because there was like a, there was the ambulance behind the ambulance. There's another vehicle, and so like everything was like bright. I think it might. I think that might have been just the headlights of the vehicle behind. But that's like just the the image I have in my mind, right? And uh, so we get to the hospital. So just just yeah. just just for a second. So so at this point. I'm going to assume that people have probably either Googled Dalton Medlin. Yeah. Or, you know, they're, you know, listening through this. It's been known since probably October ish that uh, Dalton Medlin was killed. Yes. What you're about to describe are the circumstances of that. Yeah. Because this is the first time that Chosen will have spoken about this. To my knowledge, yes. Okay. And uh, and I, I was told for my chain of command to bring this to light. Uh, it is a very, very hard thing for me to say. I think it would be a hard thing for anybody to say. Uh, so when I was in the hospital, I was with uh, a lot of the other guys that were wounded. And one of our guys came in and he, and, uh, and he was pretty busted up. Emotionally, I should say, like... Physically, he was, he was okay. You know, obviously very, very upset. And he comes in, he says, Gimli's dead. And I was like, okay, like, is he alive? Is he dead? Like, people are telling me different stories. Like, what, what's going on? Like, someone sort themselves out. You can't sit there and play these games with guys. So I pull him aside. I'm like, what are you saying? I was like, I just got told Gimli was alive. How is he dead now? Like, what happened? And uh, we later find out that... Uh, once, once uh, there's there's enough sunlight, the Russians sent out a patrol to to into the tree line to the Russian position that ambushed us, and uh, they found Gimli there. And Gimli was very obviously uh, like an American soldier. He had you know American flag patch, obviously, uh, you know Texas patch, and they they removed his kit, you know, and executed him. I and mean, well, this was watched on yeah. a drone. So the Ukrainians obviously had, uh, I mean, we're not going to not have a drone. Like uh, our guys, 
we still had guys in the area. And uh, so they had a drone up and a, and Russians would have known that the drone was there. I mean, you can hear them, right? And yeah, they knew he was alive. They knew he was wounded. They could have taken him as a POW. They could have taken him. And instead they decided to execute him. And then they took his shit and they booby trapped him. And then they, they put grenades underneath, his, underneath him. And then they threw mines around his body. And that is something that eats, eats at me, knowing that that happened. And our unit mounted, I think, uh, three attempts to try and get to, get to him. Uh, in, the, in those attempts, uh, multiple guys got wounded because the, the Russians, as, as we discussed earlier, they like to try and prevent us from doing that. So they changed, they set up uh, uh, like direct fires, right? Or DFs, right? So they, they uh, set up DFs. So when the guys would try and stage to go and get Gimli, you know, there's that one trail. So just like I sat on the trail of my PKM, they, they set up the AGS and mortars and, and artillery at the Ukra Ukrainian end of the trail. So when our guys would try and set up to try and go down there, they would just hammer them with IDF. And, you know, then we started getting guys wounded trying to get to Gimli, you know? And it became a, a situation where we couldn't get to them. And then, uh, so this is the end of September, right? And then once October hit, uh, anybody that's been paying attention to what's going on in, in Ukraine for the last couple months, the Russians dumped 70,000 troops into Donetsk. Donetsk area, I should say, and start pushing to Avdivka. And now our priorities shift because now our, our unit got turned from uh, an assault unit, from a shock unit to uh, helping out with defensives. Defensive specific to Russia's Avdivka yeah. offensive. So we weren't in Avdivka. And I don't want to take away from, from what's going on, what, what happened with Gimli, but it, uh, that that ended up being a huge, well, the main reason why we couldn't make any more attempts to try and go get him. We, it uh, does add context to, you know, Gimli's death, though, because yes. up until that point, you had continuously tried to achieve his body. Yes. Was yeah, there that, a, that was that, that was like there wasn't our unit was no longer looking for other ops. That was the op. that was the op. Recovery of yes, Gimli's body. Yeah, like we're. Uh, I know there's plans. I mean, at this time I was in the hospital, so again it was just what I was getting from from talking to guys, and even then, like I was fucked in my head. Uh, I just wanted to fucking die, and you know I'm not trying to take away from anything. So I was, I, yeah, like I know they were trying to go from one way, you know, down the lane that that we took. And then it was, they're like, fuck it. We're just going to go because there's another trench, one uh, trench 110. It's this larger trench, corner trench, like a T trench. They're like, fuck it. We're going to take 110. We're going to kill every fucking Russian there. And we're going to, these guys in the tree line, they're going to have nowhere to go. Ukraine's one side, them on the other. Fuck them. We're going to slaughter them all. You know, you want to take our boy? We're going to take all of you. And then. Uh, but then you got retasked. And retasked, yeah. The unit got, uh, got sent out to start doing defensives. And that. The things I've heard from from the guys doing the defensives are just incredible. Uh, you know, sixteen dudes going up against hundreds of Russians, BMPs, tanks, you know, drones everywhere, artillery, mortars, and the dudes kept going out. Just waves, waves of Russians, waves, waves and waves all day, sun up, sun down. Just keep going, and these, and these guys were, you know, exposed. They would come, they would, they would go out, and we we would hear they'd be out there for you know day or so and then we'd hear we'd hear the stories like how you know everybody's getting hit and it's like jesus fuck because the uh, russians had all these resources with all those men right and it was just yeah they, that, that it was it was incredible the, the stories i mean uh, it was just yeah it, i mean uh, the fields out there just from that just bodies Bodies everywhere, burnt up vehicles, tanks, 
Like I know uh, over over a few days, there was eight uh, eight uh, javelin teams, Ukrainian javelin teams, that were taken out because they were they were just taking out vehicles left, right, and center, taking out tanks, and uh, like uh, it, it just ridiculous. Artillery was just constantly like a lot of resources got pushed over to that area to try and to try and push back this this offensive, and uh, our guys our guys were doing defensives and. Uh, uh, they're doing defensives for, I think, like two months, month and a half. Yeah, and then it was, our guys got tired, and they're like, "Fuck it, we're gonna start pushing back." So our dudes were doing small unit assaults, just raids, go in, kill some Russians, harassment kind of stuff. Yeah, they would just go in, go in nighttime, kill a bunch of Russians. All right, pull back. And that 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 all the waves go back to part of the discussion we had earlier where everybody at this point, Evdivka and the fall of Evdivka is relatively new. Yeah. Uh, and Russia, Russia has achieved ground, but well, it they've, is, they've, but what you're sharing is it is gathered, at like they, the they cost. Control. Yeah. It's insane. Cause they, they started with, like, I mean, I think there's something like they lost like something like four people, four men for every like square meter they took. Mm. Which is just fucking retarded. You know, it just goes to show like the Russian mentality, how they how they look at human lives. You know, it's not, they don't even look at it like a financial thing. They're just like meat. You know, disposable meat. We'll get more. Don't matter. We'll find more. Whether if they find them in Russia or they find them in poor countries, they don't give a shit. They want that ground. They don't care. I think they're probably more concerned about the the equipment, the the clothing that they give these guys for the very minimal time that they're alive. You know, it's, it's, it's absolutely messed up mentality. What do you think, what do you think the end state to all of this is? That's a well, loaded question. When it, when it comes, when it, just to continue on the Adika thing, I think, cause that really happened and it happened when the Ukraine was in need of supplies. And if they had the supplies, they could have held out because the Ukrainians were fucking destroying. Cause they, the ground around it, they could see for kilometers. They had a lot of standoff, right? It's a very flat area, and yeah. Too, so yeah, and it was like so, like any time that the, they could see when uh, I mean, just with with intelligence, with reconnaissance drones and stuff like that, they could see when the Russians are mounting up to come do a push, and they would start hammering them. So the Russians were getting hammered and losing men for kilometers before they before they could even get close enough to fire around. Vehicles were already getting destroyed. They're already getting gunned down. Like that's that's how. Advika was able to hold out for so long is that they had, they had the upper hand, they had the ground, right? They had, they just needed, they needed the weapons, they needed the, the ammo, they needed the support and it never came. Enough of it never came, I should say. Other mm -hmm. countries dipped in, other countries claimed that they were going to help and it, 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 nothing came, it didn't, enough didn't come in time, you know? And now Advika fell. And it's unfortunate. It really, really, truly is. Like these guys were fighting. They were fighting hard. There's a lot of guys who are fighting hard. Guys in Chosen were fighting hard. Outnumbered every day. Outnumbered. Insane odds. You know, like guys just nonstop, just getting hammered, wounded, and you still have to fight. You have no choice. You can't pull back. You know, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. And and our guys, our guys, and the Ukrainians held out for as long as they could. You know, I mean, if you look at the live map, Provomayask is still under Ukrainian control. Mm. A lot of the ground south of Provomayask is still under Ukrainian control. You know, like it's, like I, I'm, when I, when I see these guys, you know, uh, it, it's, it's just amazing. You know, I don't want anybody thinking like I'm a hero when I'm, I'm surrounded by dudes that are absolute fucking heroes. Great men, great men. I would, I would never trade, trade them for, for anything. You know, I, 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 I can only hope that these guys spread their skill set and their mindset and their mentality to, to other soldiers, you know, other men. You know, multiply them, make more of these guys. These are phenomenal men. You know, we've, we've lost some great men, but we have a lot of other great men. And we keep finding more and more great men. They keep coming to us. And that's, that's one thing I'm hoping to achieve with this podcast. I'm hoping we, we can get us out there, get the attention out there where you know, other guys with this mindset will come to us. You know, they'll find us. Maybe not even just us. Find a, a unit like us. 
you know, find, find another foreign fighter unit that's willing to push, find a green unit that's willing to push, find something, you know, NGOs, they can come and help us out. People can go and, and donate to NGOs. Not even, I don't even care if they help us out specifically, help someone out. I mean, be careful which NGO you choose. Make sure it's a legitimate one. Make sure it's a, it's a good one. Um, make sure you do your research on it. Uh, like I recommend pr Protect the Volunteer. I mean, you can find me on their Twitter at pr Protect the Volunteer. Or, and uh, I mean, you'll see me doing God knows what on there because I don't know what I'm doing on Twitter. <laughs> but like, there's ways to help. And I think they call it like, that's the grassroots, right? So even individuals, like, you know, anybody, you can donate 25 bucks. That may not seem like a lot, but thousand people don't donate 25 bucks that's 25 grand that'll mean a lot to a unit over that the supplies they could get with that medical equipment they could get night fighting gear it's something something's always better than nothing too many people think someone else would do it well what if everybody thought instead of everybody thinking someone else would do it what if everybody thought well i'll do a little bit a little bit turns into a lot right fucking quick right and i think yeah I just, I just hope this reaches some of the right minds and I hope this reaches some of the right people. And I hope, uh, you know, I hope it does some good. And I hope I didn't piss off too many chosen guys by doing this. I don't think it should, you know, uh, I think it's, uh, these are all stories from, it seemed from the heart, you know, I only have, of course, the perspective that you provide, um, it doesn't feel like there was any embellishment. It doesn't feel like there was, you know, putting anybody down. It, it feels like you're trying to represent your team uh, in the best way that you can, right? We're all limited to the communication skills that we have. We're probably coming up on the end here. Is there anything that you kind of want to leave folks with? You know, and that was kind of a great understanding what you just gave of your intent, the purpose of you doing this. But is there anything more specific that you want to leave folks with, you know, where they can go, what they can do. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, if you're if you're looking to fight, find a unit. You know, uh, you can find units on Reddit. I know there's a lot of other units that I post on Reddit. We we have Reddit. Uh, our commander, he's he's all over that place. Uh, you know, message uh, message one of them. Start talking to them, you know, picking their brains. Find a unit. It's the quickest way to get over there. If you try going Legion. I mean, if you if you don't have combat experience, combat experience, go Legion. You know, you'll get some. Then you'll figure out: is this for me? Is it not for me? If it's not for you, that's cool. You can either go do humanitarian work, help out, help out that way, or you know, just fund. Send send some money to people that are already out there that or, that can handle it. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, what's wrong is is not being able to hand, handle it and thinking you're going to stay because you want attention. That's wrong. That's not on. You want to fight do it that way you know if you get a hold of a, a unit directly they can get you over there a lot quicker because they can process the paperwork you know instead of you having to wait you know three four months for the legion you can go there sign up and then you go to the unit sign your contracts and it's a lot quicker uh and then uh the other thing if if you want to donate uh two uh two ngos that i work with that i personally know are good to go and that i can vouch for Protect a volunteer, obviously, I'm gonna push that one. Uh, they help out us. If you wanna to donate to Chosen Company, you can go to Protect a Volunteer, donate money, and there's a drop down menu. It's either says Chosen Company or Lovable Bozos. And uh, that goes to Chosen Company. If it's if you wanna just donate to anything, I mean, you can choose another option for whatever you wanna choose, wherever you wanna donate. I'm not gonna be upset if you donate to, to you know medical supplies for Ukrainians. That's not gonna bother me. They need stuff too. You know, we're all fighting on the same team. Uh, Another one is Ukrainian uh, Frontline, and they they tend to, to deal with medical equipment for Ukrainian units, and and that's great. They need that too. They need the, they need the equipment for training. They need it to literally keep guys alive. Like there's a reason why Ukraine has less deaths than than Russia, even though we're going against, up against insurmountable odds. It's it's because we actually take care of our guys. We would rather our guys get wounded, we patch them up, they heal, then get back in the fight. You don't lose that experience. You don't lose that that man. You don't lose. You don't. You don't have to deal with that. Uh, the the casualties of that, of that of someone's death, right? Because there's the actual like mental toll on everybody around that person when someone dies, right? There's always that good morale when someone that got brewed up and they come back out. You know, when Mossy, you know, going to the hospital and seeing Mossy. Last time I seen Mossy, 
you know, the guy could barely move. He just took a bullet in the next. And then I, I see him the next time. I mean, he looked like a zombie, but I'm taking him out of the hospital to go get McDonald's. You know, it's, it's a huge thing. You know, having guys return to the fight, having guys just get wounded and coming back, that's way better than having guys die. Medical equipment is huge. You know, night fighting gear, huge. Armor, huge. You know, help out. You don't have to go fight, but, you know, you can sign up to be a sponsor. You can sponsor actual soldiers, you know, and when you're sponsoring a soldier, you can actually talk to that guy. Like, they'll, they'll put you in connection with him. So you could sit there and be talking to a guy that's fighting in Ukraine, and then you get to hear his stories. You get to know what, what he's doing, you know? He could send you pictures. I mean, she, he, she, whatever, I don't give a fuck. But you make that personal connection with that person. I mean, I know, um, I know, I know one guy. I mean, I don't know him personally, but there's one guy. He he had a sponsor, and I guess they got along well enough. They're getting married. I'm not saying you'll you'll get to marry your own personal <laughs> gladiator, but I mean, who knows? Who knows? The world's the world's a weird place. You know, you'll meet you'll you, you can do good. Anybody can do good. Anybody can help out in any way, right? Or just go to your freaking politicians and tell them to stop dicking around. I don't know. Well. All I can say is that I, I'm extremely appreciative of you coming out here to share, you know, not just chosen story, but your personal stories for kind of, you know, I, I, I hate to put it this way, but leveraging us to tell the story of Gimli uh, and, you know, make sure the world understands that yeah. you know, what happened to him. That's that's a story that I, I'm sure every one of us in Chosen wishes was just not a story that even existed that needed to be told. I'm sure. But, um, at a bare minimum, I'm, I just thank you for coming out, you know, and uh, I think that this has been a, a very insightful conversation for me. I, you know, wish you and Chosen the best. Um, and thanks again. Thanks, man. Thanks.